The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the producers and the individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the staff of the Sun Prairie Media Center, its members or underwriters, the board members of the Media Center Commission, Charter Communications, TDS Telecom, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Hi, this is John Quinlan and welcome to Forward Forum. On this week's show, a uh, very special guest uh, wanted to have a chance to have in studio for a long time. Uh, Stu Levitan is here. We're going to be talking about his book, Madison in the 60s. And I'm just going to plunge right in because we're going to try to interweave uh, some biographical information, information uh, as I often do with, with an author, about kind of what motivated Stu to, to write this book and how it resonates, uh, I guess, with his own life experience. So, hey, Stu, welcome. Well, Stu. thanks for having me, John. Looking forward to this. Uh, so great to have you here. Mara, why don't we just start right in on some slides, if we could. Uh, so we will feature first, I think, just the, uh, the book cover, okay. give people a sense of this. Where, where can which, people which get, actually see which right, we got right behind, behind us, too? This. But where, where can folks find the book? Well, uh, I, was, I would have said at any local Madison bookseller, but it is moving so fast that uh, people really should call ahead and make sure they've got it in stock. It is, of course, uh, available at various online booksellers. I appreciate more people buying from their local bookseller, but exactly. uh, in terms of its, uh, uh, how well it's doing, it's the number one new release in three separate categories on Amazon. Which is so really cool. Which is really very gratifying, and uh, we had an event at the Barrymore Theater last night. The, the official book launch party had more than 300 people there, sold 100 books, so it's 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 doing well, um, but it's available locally. And you've been on the Wisconsin, you've been at the Wisconsin Book Festival. You've yeah. been on WPR. You've been on Wart. You're yeah. doing a special series on Wart. I, I do a five-minute podcast on the six o'clock news on Wednesday, sort of amortizing the work. And and it it's all it's very holistic because it, this spot is underwritten by the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. We wow. should give a shout out to my publisher, the Wisconsin Historical Society Press, and they're providing underwriting, which helps support WORT and helps publicize the book. It's a virtuous circle, as we would say. And, and it's it's in multiple media, I mean, which is which is kind of yeah. the new reality of books. Yeah, yeah, you have to, you know, th there's, a, there's a thin line between ego and vanity and marketing. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I have to say, well, I'm not just being vain, I'm, I'm actually marketing. Uh, but exactly. It, yeah, I find myself spending some time on social media, yeah. So I just want to briefly, uh, Mara, if you could move on into the next slides. Um, Let me just say so, just yeah, a, 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 a yeah. thing about this cover. Right. Uh, they did such a, gr I had nothing to do with the cover. The cover was presented to me. I said, oh my gosh, that's a great cover. We've got anti-war protests. We've got the National Guard on campus. We've got the debate over whether or not to build a, a civic auditorium in the style of Frank Lloyd Wright. We've got the campus. We've got State Street. I think this cover really pops. It really tells you what some of the stories in the book are. I think it's one of its appeals because yeah. it just draws people yeah. in. Uh, so go on to the next slide if you could. So, so as I said, we just want to establish a little bit more of the Stu Levitan <laughs> story. I, yes. I snuck onto your Facebook page. Apparently, yeah. Uh, and, and me and Dad. And, and yeah. I, you know, what I was trying to get at is where you were at in the 1960s. This is probably actually the 1950s, late 50s yeah, or I was, so. Yeah, I was born in November 1953, which if you're doing your math means I just became Medicare eligible. Okay. Um, so this, this photo, I'm probably six, you know, five or six. So this is late 1950s. Yeah, I didn't get to Madison until 1975. And that's one reason why I was able to write the book because I'm not in it. Right. Uh, you know, I wrote a book on the early history of Madison called uh, the um, the on, illustrated sesquicentennial history, which ends at 1931, and people said, "Well, where's Volume Two? Mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, I'm kind of in Volume Two because right. I I chaired the uh, the zoning board and the plan commission, the community development authority, and the landmarks commission. So you can't really write as a historian about things you're a part of. And we'll, it will, well, let's get into your bio just a second. Yeah. But just let me flash through a couple yeah. more pictures first. Okay. Uh, so you know, I think I've told you. Um, uh, you know, I've been very touched by seeing some of the oh, photos. Mom, There's yeah. your mom. My mother... Um, this is 1965, I believe. That looks about right. Yeah, my mother was a playwright and a poet and an actress and a performance artist. Um, she also threw the tarot cards and, and, and was Gene Houston's yeah. lieutenant on this metaphysical, uh, dramanon, sort of mystical kind of thing. Yeah, I take... I, I am so clearly the 
some product of my parents and next interest slide and we expertise. Could. Yeah, this yeah, is mom and dad. Folks, and, with, and that's a Keith Haring. Um, yeah, I, I remember that, yeah. A, a jersey that she's wearing, yeah. Um, I, I kind of keep the uh, the goatee in honor of dad, <laughs> but uh, some people tell me I should I should shave it. I, I think, yeah, my folks, I, I am clearly the uh, the product of their interest. I, in I their did expertise. take a picture of you with a David Letterman style beard. Oh but yeah, I think, yeah, it, yeah. I think it's missed the lineup, but that was <laughs> yeah, pretty. That was what that was uh, the the beard that went past being a rabbi into being a hobo. <laughs> yes, yeah, it, it was, was right yeah, up yeah, there. Yeah. And I guess next one, if you could, Mara. So, ah, yeah. so this this I gave you a hard time about yeah, at me, your birthday party. Me, me uh, last at eighteen, week. I was pretty hot at eighteen. You were very hot say, at eighteen. I can say so myself. By yeah. by all audiences, I'm sure. Yeah, and that's Oscar Wilde. And yeah. and uh, I I do at least the hair. <laughs> there's a real resemblance there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. this is actually you would have been this would have been in the 1960s, right? In the, uh, this or, photo was taken or Christmas 1971. This photo 71, was taken so just into okay. Christmas December 1971. I just turned eighteen. So essentially, ages seven to seventeen is the sixties for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. That but that's me. Nineteen early nineteen eighties. Okay. I believe I was actually on the Dane County Board of Supervisors, looking like that. Or that's uh, that was my late press days. Yeah. That was uh, my sister gave me that jersey. Yes. That was. So yeah. off of this photo, and then when we come back yeah. in the studio in a second. But so in nineteen seventy five, you moved to Madison really early on. Uh, I think you were 21. Um, you, you, uh, James Weefold decided yeah. to give you an opportunity yeah. to cap times. Changed my life. I was in 1975. I had just graduated from college, a little hippy dippy liberal arts college in Sarasota, Florida, called New College, where Emma Gonzalez has just matriculated ah. from from Parkland. So that's, okay, we're very proud that that she's joined us. Um, I just graduated from college, and my idea was Fred Harris was the United States Senator from Oklahoma and was uh, driving around the country in a Winnebago campaign, running for president. Uh -huh. Jim Hightower was his campaign manager, LaDonna Harris is his okay. wife. So my plan was I'm gonna drive around, follow Fred Harris around all these states, write Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, 1976, sell it to Rolling Stone, and be the Hunter Thompson for the 21st century. This is, this is my plan. But I knew I needed a backup plan, so every, city we went to, I'd go talk to the newspaper because I figured, well, m if this Rolling Stone thing doesn't work out, maybe I can get a job as, as a newspaper reporter. And I go to the, I mean, uh, Madison, Capital Times, liberal newspaper. I go see Dave Zwiefel. They're still on the square in the old building on Carroll Street before they move out to Fishatry Road. And I go and he goes, well, we don't have any jobs, but hey, our Washington correspondent, Erwin Knoll, just quit. How'd you <laughs> like to be our Washington correspondent? I go, Mr. Zwiefel, I'm 21 years old. He goes, ah, oh, you'll be great, you'll be great. You go, you go. So, well, you know, Dave Zwiefel was publishing his own newspaper in high school, so, I mean, he could see. Yeah, and yeah. Dave Zwiefel was hired <laughs> by Mr. Evu himself. Right. So, I, so it's Bill Evu, Dave Zwiefel, me. So it's like, whoa. <laughs> um, so I go to Washington, and then in the summer of 77, they bring me out here to work, city, to work under the Guild contract, on staff, and if, I say so myself. I was I was the golden boy this summer, man. Hey, Stu, go to go to Crandon and expose the Exxon mine um, shenanigans. Or Stu, cover the Capitol. Stu, do this. And it was a, it was great. I was living on Few Street and I was hanging out and I was just it was wonderful. And then at the end of the summer, they sent me back to Washington. A week later, we went on strike. Yeah. And I was I was at this point. I'm 23 years old. I'm in in my efficiency apartment in Washington. And I have to decide, what side am I on? And we flash back to my parents. My parents were good, liberal, Jewish intelligentsia who raised me to know you don't cross a picket line. Yep. If there's a picket line, you honor it. And it's like, and as an independent contractor, there was nothing the, the union could do for me if I, if I followed the strike. There's nothing they could do to me if I didn't follow the strike. It was completely on my own. My parents taught me right. I quit the paper. I joined the Press Connection. Did that in Washington for a year or so. Moved to Madison full time in February 1979. Another piece of history that's resonant with that is we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of the progressive yeah. breaking the nuclear yeah. bomb yeah. story. Yeah, in the, pr in the and, press. And the press connection. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, because they had a restraining order against them, so the press connection yeah. went to the yeah, story. Yeah, a, a citizen writes a senator. Um, yep. That's why, uh, you know, it was so great, uh, Ron McRae came to my event last night. Yep. Um, but even, even more, uh, from, from both the Cap Times and the Press Connection, but even more 
emotionally satisfying is I got to put Dave's Weefel stories in the book. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and you know, it was just, you know, to, to, to bring that circle around, which is very satisfying. And you'll see in just a second, we have a picture, but Dave and John were here to talk about yeah. the Capital Times yeah, book, yeah. which you said in part was inspiration for well, some of well, what you did. Provide some from great uh, resource, yeah. And go ahead, Mara, with the next. You see, there oh, they yeah, are. Yeah, Dave's Weefel and John Sitting Nichols. in these very chairs. Yeah, and yeah, so that was that? a fun yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, Dave, you know, you can look back on turning points in your life. Dave's Weefel changed my life. Ah. Dave's Weefel giving me that chance to come to Madison and be a reporter. You know, um, of course, I made some decisions that were also important. I mean, if I had gotten that decision about the strike wrong, if I had scabbed, there's no doubt in my mind today I would be a broken down alcoholic ex-city editor living on the outskirts of Kansas City. Uh -huh. And to know that when it came nut time for that one decision that's going to uh, change my life, my parents taught me well. And that, that, you know, everything has flown from that. Yeah, my favorite interviews have been with Dave. Uh, I got yeah. to do one on the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination. Yeah. And he was... Yeah. Yeah, he was uh, a yeah. part of covering that story, yeah. and then and then Caston Meyer, and then and yeah. then this this last time. N now now after yeah. I after I uh, but flashback after I'd yeah. been in Washington for a year and a half from seventy five to seventy seven, and came back out in seventy seven, I drove nonstop across country. Um, I show up at the new offices on Fish Hatchery Road. I'm dressed all in black. My hair is long and matted. I got a day and a half worth of road grime. I go, Dave Stu Levitan, and he looks up <laughs> and he goes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> says a word that, I, that I, even uh, even on cable, I should, and it's like, oh, good to see you too, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is not quite like the Nichols story yeah, yeah, where, yeah. Where, where they met and, and Dave wanted to, yeah, anyway, yeah, so yeah, 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 it was very interesting. Yeah. And next slide, please, Maura. So uh, somebody oh. else who's interesting, you, you mentioned, well, you, well, you mentioned Hightower, Hightower earlier. Jim Hightower, who, who of course, came on uh, to be, you know, doing lots of stuff, especially with, with Bernie and with, with Ed Garvey. But yeah, there's Jim Hightower. Ed Garvey at right. And, yeah. and part of the reason I brought this slide on, again, is just to give people a taste of it. The fascinating part of the, about the book is you talk about Ed, Ed, young Ed Garvey. You talk about all, a young Ed, Shirley Abrams and all these other well, see, people. That, that, I mean, that's one of the things that history reminds you is that people we know as bold-faced names in the 80s and the 90s and the aughts, they were college kids once. Yep. Ed Garvey was a college student, and Ed Garvey was president of the Wisconsin Student Association and then the National Student Association. Shirley Abrahamson was the young lawyer who wrote our Fair Housing Code. Um, we had members of the Football Hall of Fame, the College Football and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in college at the same time. Pat Richter and Steve Miller were in school at the same time, yep. along with Ben Sidron and Boz Skaggs and Jeff Greenfield and Lowell Bergman. Daniel Travanti. You Daniel J. Travanti. From Hill Street Tracy Blues. Nelson. All yeah. these, and and it reminds us that when we interact with college students today. Mm. To not condescend to them, to not think of them as, oh, you're just 19 or 20, but think of them as the future bold-faced names of, of the next generation and to, and to give them the respect and to understand that they got something to offer. That's, that's one of the things I loved about this book was finding the, the and of course, Paul Soglin. Paul Soglin, as, as an undergraduate running for the WSA Senate, to, yeah. s to see those creation stories of people who have become really important in our lives, to see where they began. We'll, we'll get to this when the slides come up, yeah. but, but also, I mean, on a national level, uh, young John Lewis came to town. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the, the folks who led the civil rights movement were in their, 19, you know, in their yeah. late teens and yeah. 20s, for yeah. goodness yeah. sake. Yeah. Yeah. Or when Mr. Dillon came to town at age 18. Boy, you know, trying to write the story of Bob <laughs> Dillon in Madison. Bob Dillon spent two weeks, a fortnight or so in Madison in early 1961. The historic significance is that Madison is the last place Bob Dillon was before he went to New York for the first time, he went. He actually caught a car from here to yeah, yeah, a, a ride a, a, out a to guy, New York a guy to Greenwich Village. Fred Underhill, yeah, yeah. And, and ended up stealing Fred's guitar case. <laughs> um, but this, but as 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 a writer, as a historian, this this drove me mad. I interacted. I either spoke or emailed with everybody who put him up, everybody who dealt with Dylan in that two-week period, and they all had different stories. He stayed here. No, he stayed here. He did this. No, he did that. And some of their accounts are published and some are, are, are just private. And trying to write a narrative that wove all the things that they told me together but didn't violate anybody's published account yeah. w was, was, was a 
almost Herculean task to try and to weave this narrative, but I figured I've got to write the definitive story of Bob and Madison. 19 years old, Bob Dylan in Madison. Bob Dylan playing at the pad, man. Bob <laughs> Dylan, uh, play, you know, playing on that little uh, upright piano while Danny Kalb is 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 blowing harp. Oh, is is great. Can't yeah. imagine why it took you three years to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. And uh, ah, me and the two, the greatest of all time. This who is, came to Madison in the late '60s, and uh, so you talk about that. But yeah, this, this is more recent. Yeah, but, um, the, 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 this is uh, when when he was um, signing some autographs uh, at an event. Uh, somewhere on the west side of Madison. And you were writing an article for I Isthmus I wrote an on article it? for Isthmus on it, yeah. You know, that's that's another subtext that just runs through my entire time in Madison is the number of opportunities I've been given um, by people who could have given those opportunities to somebody else. Yeah. I mean, to, to, ha to have editors and assignment editors and, and news directors and, and program directors say, you can do this. We're offering you the opportunity to write this story, to have this radio program, or to do this TV show. It's, it's just, I mean, the, the, the blessings of opportunity that I've been given in Madison uh, blow my mind. And more recently, a couple of years ago, you came to the library. I was helping organize the indie film uh, process. It was a film on, on uh, Muhammad Ali. Yeah. You were able to speak to that. Um, I got you a great poster out in New you York. You did. I yeah. really appreciate it. And, <laughs> but the, the Ali story uh, in the book is Ali as a black Muslim separatist. Right. In 1968, um, Ali coming as part of the International Students Against War, Racism, and the Draft uh, weekend, but he only wants to talk about racism. He doesn't want to talk about the war, doesn't want to talk about the draft. He's just giving the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's black Muslim approach to racism and, and economic separatism. And it really offended a lot of people because he, he called uh, integration hypocritical. He interracial said, marriage. He said interracial marriage should be prohibited. Muhammad Ali yeah. coming out against mixed marriages. And this was, a lot of the white students were very uneasy with this. And it was a very different Muhammad Ali than he was in later years. Right. Um, I don't know. Or was it? I, I don't, don't know. know. I, I, well, I, you know, I mean, I think, I think Muhammad was a pretty consistent Guy, there are some things he talked about more or less. I, I think, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the, to the extent that, you know, when Malcolm X went to Mecca and came back, he was, he was some change. I, I certainly, Muhammad, I believe, uh, evolved into a, a more, a, he, he, he grew less separatist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, more, more of a pluralistic yeah, understanding yeah, of religion yeah, yeah, and politics yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. interracial but in, relations. But in 68, it was a hardcore black separatist. But, but that's the theme, to see these people then yeah. and then to project on what they became later yeah. is just so powerful. So, yeah. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, so I'm not sure great, when, okay. this, this is probably mid 70s. Well, but. Yeah, it looks like 76 because, uh, yep. yeah. Um, Three great people. That's that's um, uh, Mary Louise Mary, Simon. Mary, Mary, no, that's that, that's Mary Lou Muntz. Oh, is it Mary Lou Muntz? That's Mary Lou uh, Muntz. You know, it was captioned wrong where I found okay. it. Okay, it's Mary Lou Muntz and Bob Castamar and Midge Miller. Um, Midge Miller appears in the book in 1968 in her context of um, working for Gene McCarthy, running the Gene McCarthy um, presidential campaign office. Just essentially encouraging Gene McCarthy to run in a yeah. way that led to Lyndon Johnson yeah. not to run. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the, uh, the man was Bob Castamar, who was um, uh, the congressman throughout this period from 1958 to 1990. And the other woman um, was, was uh, Mary Lou Muntz, who would become, um, the fir I believe, the first woman to head the powerful Joint Finance Committee right. in the legislature. Um, uh, Mary Louise Simon, who, who, had, who that had identified, but incorrectly, Mary Louise Simon was a very important person. She was in, in the, we remember her as the first woman to head a county board in Wisconsin. In my time period, she was the vice chair and the chair of the uh, um, Equal Opportunities Commission and right. was very instrumental in the adoption of the first fair housing code in the state of Wisconsin. So we'll bring that narrative back in in yeah. just a second. Go ahead, uh, Mara. Let's see what we got up next. Uh, so what I wanted to mm. contrast here, this is 1960s, uh, yeah. the, the boundaries of Madison. Why don't you go ahead and flash onto that next slide. So you see the dramatic change yeah. that happened. Madison was annexation mad. Yeah. And so the city grew physically during that time. But I think there's a metaphor there. I mean, the city grew in so many yes. ways. What a decade from 60 to, to and, 69. And, 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 and this is, I think, the high water. Everything in black is annexations during the decade of the 60s. David Michael Miller, who did all the um, annotating in the book and, and did this map, did, did a great job with this map. Um, 
Yeah, the, you'll, you'll see the very valuable property on the west side at Mineral Point Road. Yep. W city annexed almost the entirety of the downtown business district of Blooming Grove um, out on the east side. The city really... There's a few fractured remnants of Blooming yeah. Grove on that side of town, um, but basically just took over Blooming Grove. And, and, and this, the, but, but this all stopped. The, the annexation almost completely stopped in 1961. Almost all that annexation is 1661 oh, because in 1961 Henry Reynolds got elected mayor and he was he really put the brakes on the annexation program that the former mayor Ivan Nestigan had instituted so so that's that's a essentially a liberal conservative shift very much so yeah yeah Ivan Nestigan the 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 way municipal histories and and world histories change on what one individual does. Yeah. Ivan Nestigan was the liberal pro Monona Terrace mayor of Madison, had been elected um, in a special election in the mid 1950s. He is the one who signed the contract with Frank Lloyd Wright in 1956 to do Monona Terrace. Um, he was very active in in the Kennedy campaign. He chaired the statewide Kennedy campaign in 1960. He was reelected without opposition. Think about this. The mayor of Madison was reelected unopposed yeah. in 1959, is about to be elected again unopposed. So it's in December, right before the Jan election. This is, this is January. This is, this is 10 days before nomination papers close. Yep. No word out of the Kennedy administration on a job for Ivan Nestigan. So he figures, well, I'm going to be mayor again, takes out his, his nomination papers. I think the day after the inaugural, the telegram comes offering Ivan um, the undersecretaryship of health, education, and welfare, number two job yeah. at a federal cabinet position. He quits. Henry Reynolds, the conservative anti Monona Terrace mayor, gets elected mm. um, over um, the administrative assistant to Ivan Nestigan. So instead of having Another two years of a liberal pro Monona Terrace mayor, we all of a sudden do this 180 degree change to have a conservative anti Monona Terrace mayor who gets elected for four years. And then that bounces back to the liberal Otto Feske. So, so the back and forth of the, ideology, the, of the ideology of the mayor is all put in motion by Ivan Nessigan's decision to suddenly quit and take this job in Washington. But the theme here is the notion of a 60s liberal Madison. It was much more complicated than that. It was much more complicated than that. Um, yeah, I don't, be, because most of what we remember about this, I don't want to say everything, but a lot of what we think we remember about the 60s is wrong. Mm. Um, Madison had a very conservative mayor from 1961 to 1965 had a moderately liberal mayor from 65 to 69, that's, I, that's Otto Feske, then elected a, a, a hardcore conservative mayor in 1969, Bill Dyke. Um, and, and it's very difficult to put liberal conservative terms on things back then because everything changed so much um, bet between the civil rights movement and the, and the anti-war movement Everything got very confused, and well, I'm sure we'll talk in greater detail and about of course, you know, and Republicans were progressive, or at least a lot of them were, and the Democratic Party was just getting re-energized again, so it was just gaining well, its... So, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of those definitions didn't fit in the early 60s. It, especially in civil rights. Yep. Um, when the civil... And I, I assume we'll, we'll, yes, we'll talk about next. it in greater <laughs> detail, So, but the, the politics of civil rights um, and the Fair Housing Code, very complicated. Next slide, please. So, mm. I think... Uh, okay, I just wanted to give a little bit of a flavor. Uh, 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 Rachel, oh, that, one of our that, producers, just loved that shot. Oh, this is th looking down East Wash, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, back in the days of cruising. And this, and actually, l let me talk for a minute about why we're seeing those. Yeah, this is a negative that, that I took a, a negative. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's an app you can take photos of negatives and it'll be, come out as a positive. The amount of time I spent in the archives just looking through negatives, uh -huh. um, just looking through photos, and, and you know, you'd see a photo in the newspaper and say, okay, here's a newsworthy event, and you'd go to the archives and you'd look, you know, for every newspaper, for every photo that's in the paper, there are 30 that aren't. And just looking through the archives and saying, oh, that's a great, oh, that's a picture I haven't seen before, and, and coming out and and, oh, so I just love. I had the, as much fun doing the research as I did doing the and writing. This is one of the reasons, at the age of fifty-six, that I am embarking on a library yeah. science degree with an emphasis on archival science because uh, it's fascinating. The the the, <laughs> the resource we have 
uh, historical in, societies. In, in Madison, Wisconsin, yeah. to have the, the Wisconsin State Historic, the Wisconsin Historical Society, yeah. ar library and archives, and and the Madison Public Library. Oh my goodness. For that matter, the Veterans Museum, one yeah. of the best, of, uh, one of the yeah. only of its kind that's state subsidized, that does what it does. Well, you know, I, mean, I wonder, I didn't, th there's so much in the war, on the war in this book, but I didn't, and I thought I had everything I needed. I, I did not do any research yeah. at, the, at the Veterans Museum. I wonder what I missed. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, you know, so much of their stuff is grounded in the Civil War and yeah. the subsequent conflicts. Yeah. But yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. You said maybe there are things that you could get into another edition of the book, maybe? Well, there or? will be, I mean, we're, there will certainly be a second printing. I mean, yep. we're getting close to a second printing. And, you know, a mistake or two has cropped up. You know, on, on, on page 83, I, I had an address wrong. You know, <laughs> so that's something we can correct. Um, I don't know that I can do any new yeah. research for it, but, you know, there, there, will, there will be a couple of tweaks in the second printing. Well, so the, I, th this, this book may be a catalyst for other uh, new research into this period. You know, this book is, this book is a, a is, <coughs> excuse me, is a chronicle. And this book is going to be the jumping off point for a lot of additional, a lot of new research. Th this is... This is essentially if you took every new, if you read every newspaper for the decade, mm -hmm. and read all the oral histories, and and went into the archives and looked at the correspondence, and distilled it all into one volume, that's this book. And then you can go from this book, in, in into all sorts. You can okay, here here's here's the the skeleton, here's the framework. Let me build on it. So okay. I, I think this is is the foundational work for a lot of new research to come. So Mara, once you scroll through these, just uh, several seconds on each, I think I'm, what I'm essentially uh, trying to evoke here is just a sense of yeah. what the place looked like. Yeah, this, so, so yeah. yeah. Actually, hold on this for a second. But I mean, this is State Street. This is a State Street with traffic on it. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'm on all these Facebook pages, especially if you grew up in Madison, if you grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, you remember and, yep. and historic. And a lot of people say, "Oh, this was great. Let's go back." No, 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 no. 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 But yeah, people their the, the, the romantic view of State Street with with cars and and there's some shots up State Street of the Capitol. They're just so romantic. But yeah, people love and people love looking at this, going, "Okay, that's a '63 Valiant, and you know that's yep. a '65 Impala." And, and yeah, I love dating the photo. People, I date photos by buildings. There are people who I'm date photos by cars. By, by cars. No yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Next slide, please. And so this is uh, this we, we, is the ca this is the Capitol 1960, and we can yep. tell that because we see the Park Hotel at the corner ah. of. Um, Carroll and uh, Main Street. We, we see the um, uh, Wisconsin Life Insurance Building where 30 on the square will soon rise. And w w one of the things, I'm taking Bill Cronin's course. I'm, I'm a senior guest auditor at the university in making the American landscape. And one of the phrases that we, we work with is, what time is this place? Uh -huh. How do we date this photo by the topography, by, by the geography, by the built environment. We can date this photo um, by the fact that the Park Hotel is still there, that the um, Atwood and Bleed buildings are still there, that the Wisconsin Life Insurance Building is still there. If the next slide is going to be 1965, yeah, why don't you go to the next one? We'll see what we got here. No, oh, this is um, it was yeah, just this, yeah, this is uh, just this actually go, go back for just one second if you could to the Capitol shot. I was just going to say I have a shot from 1983. A friend took me up in a small plane at oh, dusk yeah. uh, over the city. And it is just, but it's so fascinating because people immediately remark, but this building's not here, this not here. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful shot. The Freiburg right. Sister City uses yeah. it on their page now. But, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's amazing how these changes have happened yeah. and what that evokes. Manchester's was on the square, you know, which it was when I first came to town. Right, right. That's not here anymore. I've, I've got some photos yeah. in the book. I don't know if we're going to see them, but there, I've got a photo, an aerial that shows the old Carnegie Library uh -huh. that shows the Christ Presbyterian Church that shows the Manchester, not just Manchester's, but also the Manchester Pigeonhole parking ramp. Okay. Uh, and and now these are the photos. I mean, I just love looking at these photos and seeing what stories are these photos telling. And and when this build, the 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 um, the back and forth, the the. The way th development plays out when you say this building is about to go down, when they tear down the Christ Presbyterian Church, that's going to start a development fight that's going to last for a year and a half. Yeah. Because when this building goes down, someone's going to want to build this here and move that there and do this, and it just all plays out. So let's go for a little further. Um, so this next shot is Langdon Street. Langdon Street. I mean, well, what's interesting is the reactions you, these photos elicit on your Facebook yeah. page. So someone's noting there's lots of trees. Lots here. of trees. And there's there, not yeah. trees in a lot of places no, anymore. No, and the trees are and trees. 
along State Street and especially the elms at the end of State Street. The, the photo from 1961 with just this amazing forest at the end of State Street. And then by 1969, uh, you just see, you know, the Van Vleck building and right. no trees at all. Next yeah. shot, please. Uh, okay, this, this, is, um, an er, this is June 1960. This is the, the triangle of the triangle. This is the intersection. This is before the buildings were raised for yeah. urban renewal. Yeah, the, um, to, if people are familiar with Madison, the, the, the diagonal going from upper left to lower right is West Washington Avenue. The diagonal cutting from lower left to up to the middle is uh, region into proud fit. So that's the intersection of region and West Washington. Um, the lower triangle is part of the Greenbush neighborhood that is about to be turned into the triangle. The upper part is technically the Brittingham urban renewal area. Uh, if people are familiar with the apartment buildings on stilts. Yep. It's, it's now called Park View, it was originally called Samson Plaza. That's where that is. And I'm sure we're going to talk at length about urban renewal. We are. I think when we get to the civil rights section, there is a shot of oh. uh, the, the dedication of the Gay Braxton apartments. That yeah. would be a good place to get out of this. But this is definitely something I'm, I'm curious about. Yeah. I, I, I managed the Greenbush Apartments when I first moved to Madison. Ah. Learned about the history of this neighborhood. This, this neighborhood that, as you went on in the book, it was just a tragedy. They were so short-sighted to demolish the most diverse, vibrant neighborhood that, that was that was around the the tragedy of the triangle is now the time to start talking yeah let's detail. do it a little bit because I mean, sure. we got to, I mean, yeah we, we got it up uh, but yeah but i mean we, we should it would if we can call up that picture of of the neighborhood do we have that in in, in the lot or let's, let's actually we, we will get to it in just a second but let's let's just scroll through the okay. rest of these and because it uh, really would help to, to yeah. have that that visual okay um yeah, i was just i was just sort of giving you another sense so, so the west side changed you know we people's memories are essentially that you know for all practical purposes the town ended at Midvale, well, and, and it, Hilldale it, wasn't there yet. And, right, the Hilldale yeah. opens in 1962. Yeah. Um, that's a real game changer. Um, the extension, when, when the university finally lets Whitney Way be cut through and, and cross Mineral Point Road and get all the way to the Beltline, that's a game changer. Um, yeah, Hilldale, I, I wish, you know, I look back and think there are things I, I could have emphasized more. The opening of Hilldale and what that meant in terms of spurring further what it meant in terms of reflecting the west side development that had already been yeah and spurring further west side development is is an important story i might have given a little more focus on that but the whole hill farms development i was just going to mention to westgate it was about that time northgate westgate, was about westgate that is time, 1960 so. um yeah yeah westgate and northgate are uh, pretty much the same time uh, 1960 hilldale comes in in 1962 but just say a word a moment about the whole Hill Farms development, yep. which was late 1950s, but was largely the product of the genius of Oscar Rennebaum. Um, Oscar Rennebaum was a Columbia County farm boy who went to the university, got a pharmacy degree, opened some very successful Rexall pharmacies, you know, including the one at State and Lake Street, which I hope we see the picture of because it, it still has its windows. Ah. Um, uh, would go on to become lieutenant governor. The, the, the governor died. He got he, he became governor, was uh, elected governor, um, did great things for veterans and housing, but as a regent, as a member of the Board of Regents, he is the one who came up with the notion of Hilldale as, as a university sponsor thing by creating this, by using the Shell Corporation to keep the profits for the university and for scholarships. And the combination of the residential development of Hill Farms and Hilldale was a total game changer. Just a, a, I may be able to add some stuff in post-production, but I had the same dilemma you did. I had to take 500 photos and whittle them down to about yeah. 100, so yeah. we'll yeah. see. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but if, if there's something you'd really like yeah. me to add after the fact, just mention it, yeah, we'll yeah, do yeah. that. Yeah. Next shot, please. Uh, so maple side. I, yeah, and so I wanted to mention this because, of course, historical preservation was an early interest of yours. You're still yeah, on the historical I'm, I'm, preservation. I'm chairman commission. of the City of Madison Landmarks Commission, and the reason there is a Landmarks Commission is this building, Maple Side. Okay. Um, um, Abel um, Abel Phillips was the fr and, and I'm, 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 I want to say uh, Abel Dunning and uh, I want to say Mabel. Abel and Mabel uh, Dunning were the first white settlers in Dane County to plant crops. Ah. We're talking the 1840s. He's a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. He builds this building in 1853. It's called Maple Side. It's in the town of Madison's way out University Avenue. Yep. Um, by the 1960s, it's, got, it's fallen into disuse, disrepair. Um, Dan Neviser, local realtor, has bought it, wants to tear it down and, and put up a, a 
gas station and restaurant. Um, there's a local historic preservation group called Te Chopara, which tries to save it. Navizer offers it to them, but they don't have the money to move it. Um, he sells it to the Burger King Corporation. Mm. Uh, Burger King offers it to the people. They, they don't have the money. They couldn't raise the money. They, they couldn't tried. raise the money. They tried. Um, finally, on, on Valentine's Day, 1970, it's torn you down. See, what a horrible way to celebrate Valentine's Day. Horrible, heartbreaking way to celebrate Valentine's but Day. I, what you but, mentioned, but, 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 but that was a catalyst. It was the catalyst because the yeah. Capital Times, we, we've talked about Dave Zweifel before, yeah. the Capital Times starts this publicity campaign, Save the Maple Side. And people start sending in postcards to Bill Dyke. The arch conservative law and order mayor who's just been elected in May in April 1969, and Bill Dyke takes all these postcards and goes down to the planning department and says, "Hey, why don't we draft a historic preservation ordinance?" A conservative mayor a decides conserva this. A conservative mayor Henry Reynolds pushed through the Equal Opportunities Ordinance, yeah. and a conservative mayor Bill Dyke was the father of the historic preservation ordinance. So sometimes people surprise you and they do things you don't expect. Absolutely. Next shot, please. I think we may still be in the establishing shot. But anyway, ah. we did want to talk about, obviously, Monona Terrace, yeah. about Frank Lloyd Wright. And just on to the next slide. Of course, this is the man himself. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. sitting there at Taliesin. Yeah, I was just out at Taliesin West a, a month or so ago. You know, my was, friend Barbara Wright was the was the chef in residence there for a long time. Yeah. So I got to go back, sit back, oh, really? you know, and I got to meet yeah. Minerva, and I got to meet all the, anyway, oh, just yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, should we, is this now the time to talk about, yeah. about the Civic Auditorium? Okay. What Paul Soglin accomplished in first building the Civic Center in, in, the 19, in the late 1970s and then building Monona Terrace, if you look back on how many people tried and failed to build a Civic Auditorium in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, is like, will amaze you at the level of his accomplishment. Okay. So just what you said earlier, Nestigan was an advocate of yeah. Wright. Nest but, but Wright was not universally loved in Madison by any means. Oh, Wright was hated. By, by a good segment of, of people, um, Joseph Jackson, who He passed was, away in, in, I think, April of 59. April of 59. That illustration we just saw was dated February 15th, 1959, seven weeks before he died. Uh -huh. Now, no building has meant more to Madison than Monona Terrace, and no building, I think, ever meant more to Mr. Wright than building a than Monona Terrace. And, but there were people like Henry Reynolds and Babe Ro Alderman Babe Rohr and Joseph Jackson and, and, and Marshall Brown who hated Frank Lloyd Wright for his business practices, for his politics, for his lifestyle. Joseph Jackson, who, who is by this time an octogenarian economic development activist, said he detested Wright as a man and despised him as an American citizen. And, and the context of this, of course, this is the state in which uh, McCarthy is yeah, was, was, yeah. was born. And, I mean, essentially he was blacklisted, redlisted. I mean, I don't know that he was he was seen as being a communist, but but they, they wanted he to judge. A he was a pacifist libertine. So they wanted to judge him based on yeah, his politics yeah. and supposedly his personal behavior that went along with that. Well, he he was shacking up with a married woman. Uh-huh. He was on the, he was, <laughs> come on, what do you mean? Yeah, he was shacking up with a married woman. He was on the run from his creditors. He was a deadbeat. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he stiffed a lot of people and, and his personal morality, you could rightfully find unappealing, yep. I mean, you know. And he certainly did not suffer fools gladly. So there are yeah. a lot of reasons. So that's one reason why it ran. The other problem was Law Park. Babe Rohr was the very powerful alderman from the 14th District. He's going to figure out our civil rights discussion yeah, Absolutely. For the and Babe Rohr wants this at Olin Park um, across in his district. So we had two reasons. We, we had two groups of people trying to kill Monona Terrace. But we had this beautiful lakeshore... Do we have the photo of the of the parking lot? Do we have the? I'm not sure if that the, made the final cut, the, but essentially it was a parking lot. Every, everywhere, Why everywhere. Why was the Mono Lake Shore a parking lot? <laughs> that whole area where the Monona Terrace is today was a lakefront, lakeshore parking lot. Yep. Surface parking lot, and and the photo. You look at these photos and go, what were these people thinking? And the problem is that it would. We came really close. That that photo, the the image we saw of Frank Lloyd Wright's. We went out to bid on that. We were going to build it. As, 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 as 1960 ended, people thought, we're about to build this thing. And then the bids come in too high, way too high, and, and Ivan quits, and Henry gets elected, and the people of Madison, at Henry Reynolds' urging, pass a referendum 
to officially kill Monona Terrace. It was essentially a group that was formed to kill Monona Terrace. The Citizens Realistic uh, Auditorium Association. Yep. Their whole purpose was, was to kill Monona Terrace, and they did. And this is another important subtext, is the role of referenda in the era. You know, we just had a referenda on marijuana. Okay, it was great, it was symbolic. Maybe it got uh, some people out to the polls who wouldn't have ordinarily voted, but it had no operational meaning. In the 60s, they passed referenda that had operational meaning. They killed Monona Terrace by referendum. They almost killed urban renewal by referendum. They bought the bus system by referendum. So this is a lesson that I think political people today should look at and say, wait a minute, we don't have to just pass these symbolic things. We can do things meaningfully. We, we can come up with direct legislation on a local level that will actually do things. And I hope that's one of the takeaways from the book is the revitalization of referenda as a meaningful governing tactic, not just a symbolic Well, the other thing. side, though, is in California, some of the propositions <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. are demagogues, essentially, yeah. uh, allow things to sweep through that probably aren't good 13. legislation. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, there's an argument that direct democracy isn't always the best thing. Uh, well, the qu yeah, but, 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 it, but it comes to, do we trust the, the voters of the city right. of Madison? Or not? I trust the city of, of Madison. I, I trust now. that if we put a, you know, a 15 an hour, you know, referendum or, or something that the, that, you know, the, the, the legal status may have changed on, on what the legislature will right. let us have direct legislation on. But the overall point is, back then we used them operationally in a meaningful way. Now they're being used symbolically. So I apologize. Like so many things, we're going to give short trip yeah. to the right story, to the Monona Terre story, but. One of the interesting conclusions I think I heard you draw in one of your speeches, your presentations, was, um, but it's a good thing we didn't build it in the yes. early 1960s, because what resulted eventually was so much better than what it could have been. The you know? iteration of, in, in the, the 1959 iteration and a 1967 iteration had a 2,300 seat auditorium, a 1,000 seat theater, um, a art gallery, exhibition space, banquet hall. Monona, it's, it's essentially the Overture Center, Momoka, uh, the Capitol Theater, and the Monona Terrace, all mm -hmm. of which are better than anything we would have built in the 50s or 60s. So even though the people who killed Monona Terrace and Monona Basin did so for bad reasons, it had a good result. So even though this is beyond the span of the 60s, mm -hmm. the Overture Center, the same argument you make, because it, it's, to a lot of us, it seemed to take forever. But on the other hand, maybe it's good that it took forever. Yeah, because it's, it's a spectacular, world-class building. Yeah. Um, and anything, you know, if we'd, anything that we'd built in 59 or 67 would have been inferior to what we ultimately ended up with. Interesting. Next slide, please. Some of history is ironic, and this is one of the, was, <laughs> and every once in a while, you know, there, there's, there's the, the bit about writing history and just, you know, getting down, okay, what happened, what happened, what happened, and then you have to step back and say, Okay, what did it mean that this is what happened? What, what lessons do I draw from this? What conclusions can I glean? What's the meaning of this? And that's, that's where it really gets fun. And I'm still learning things. Every time I do a new book talk, every time I do a presentation, I, I get a new insight into the material. Well, that, that's what I was referring to earlier. It's the interactive nature of a book these days. Because yeah. when you go to book festivals, when you have these special events, when you have a Facebook presence, it gives the opportunity for new people to yeah. add to your knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's try the next slide if we could. I, so I just want to mention Malele, yeah. uh, who was Betty Latimer um, in, in, in the 60s and the 70s. A am I correct that this was, was the cross, whose cross was, uh, who had a cross burned on her lawn? So it was it was Malele's family. Her, yeah. she and her husband. That, James that Latimer. This. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and th yeah. this is the other thing. That, now, now the, the thing about when they burned the cross on Betty and Jim's house, on their lawn on on Toke Boulevard, I think it was kids who didn't quite understand exactly what they were doing. But there was a cross burning on the east side in 1968 where they knew what they were doing. There was a five foot cross wrapped in, ghost, in gas soaked rags and they burned it on the lawns of these two white girls who were dating black boys. Yep. And the people who burned those crosses knew what they were doing. You, you, you talked about at least one incident where the boys essentially said, well, we didn't know what we were doing. We thought that was a fun prank. Th that, that's the thing with the Latimers. I think the Latimers, I think it was, okay. I, I think it was, it was kids who didn't quite understand no. and the Latimers forgave them. But the, the thing on the east side was different. Well, it's a little, the situation may be a little bit like Baraboo, the notion that uh, the kids didn't really understand what they were doing. Uh, and that, I think yeah, said, I, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't the, say the, that. The, the Baraboo <laughs> thing, I don't know, but, but yeah. 
from what I gather, the, the two the two things were, were were distinct, and it's partly because it was just so commonplace, and and you know racism was yeah. accepted. Uh, justifications, Rohr, who you mentioned, said the most outrageous things. You know, um, we'll talk about in great. I know when we we're, we're to about the, to move into those. Yeah, the, 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 the civil. I mean, think this one statistic will blow anyone's mind. When they were tearing down the bush, and and people had to relocate. Now the bush is about the bush is. Um, 1,155 people live in that part of, of the Greenbush area. Now, the Greenbush is bigger than the Triangle. The Green so the area west of West Wash, south of Regent Street. Yeah. When we're, yeah. Technically, the Greenbush edition, as the planners understand it, goes from um, Regent Street all the way down to Erin Street, from Mill Street to Murray Street. Yep. Um, that's technically the Greenbush edition. The part of the Greenbush that's in the Triangle Urban Renewal Area is only a segment of that. Okay. Um, but in the Triangle area, there were 1,155 people living who had to be relocated as part of urban renewal. About 800 white by 355 non-white. When they went to move, when they started tearing the bush down, tearing the Triangle down in 1962, there was no fair housing code in right. the city of Madison. There was no federal fair housing code. The degree of racial discrimination in the city of Madison meant that non-whites looking for housing had access to 20% of the housing Only, in the city. Meaning I will 80% say, was off limits I will to them. say that again, John. 20%. Yeah. yeah. 20%. And, and this is on the federal forms. The, the federal, the pre-printed federal forms of housing opportunities had total units available units available for non-whites. This is accepted, this is understood, this is the way the, the way America did business. And you were quoting civic leaders and realtors as saying, well, if a black person moves in, the property values are gonna go down, so of course we have the board restrictions of, think like about, that. Think about this, yeah. the, the board of realtors took out ads against the Fair Housing Code, okay? The board right. of realtors fought the Fair Housing Code. The only realtor to support Patrick the Fair Housing was Patrick J. Lucy, who figures in a number of instances, but, the president of the Board of Realtors, when they're fighting the Fair Housing Code, is a realtor named Earl Espeseth. Two years later, Earl S. and he's a member of the Madison Housing Authority and becomes chairman. The city of Madison's public housing authority was chaired by a man who, as president of the Board of Realtors, fought the Fair Housing Code. Right. This could not happen today. You, you ask, how, how is today different from then? This, is, this, this could not happen today. So by the time you and I were presidents of the Fair Housing Council in the mid to late 80s, realtors at least talked to me in game about embracing fair housing. Oh yeah, I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure. But 20 years before, uh-uh. I mean, no, they, no, no, no. They no. were pretty was, explicit. That, they, and I've got the ad in, yeah. in the paper. You know, they got eagles and flags and, yeah. and property rights and yeah. Um, but, but you know, how is Madison different today? Madison today would not have somebody chair its housing authority who had opposed the Fair Housing Code. Yeah, let's go ahead. I think we're about to move into the black civil rights era. Uh, I mean, rather, you're talking about different uh, people. Marshall Colson, one, yeah. one of the things I really enjoy about this book is telling people about people they've probably never heard of. Right. Um, everyone knows Jim Wright, and, and my God, Jim Wright was an important person. Jim He's Wright- one of the most important people in my life. Reverend Jim Wright was the um, for, was a chairman of the, was first chairman of the Equal Opportunities Commission and then the first director of the Equal Toward Opportunities Commission. Toward the end Commission. of the 60s, they finally yeah, made they, it a paid they, position. They, yeah. yeah. Um, but Jim Wright was not the first, w w Jim Wright was not there at the creation. Marshall Colston was there at the creation. Odell Taliaferro was there at the creation. Who was the guy who ran in 1951 for to be counsel when he was in opposition well, Ed, to Roar? Well, Ed Hill. Ed yeah. Hill. Um, yeah. And of course, by the end of the decade, we get Gene Parks. But Marshall Colston, and for people who follow music in Madison, Marshall Colston is the grandfather of the great drummer Dro Joey, Joey B. Bank. Joey B. Banks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've got and I've got a picture of Marshall and his family in there. And and to tell people the story of how Marshall Colston and Lloyd Barbie. Um, were there at the creation. So I'm confused, was, was Lloyd living in Madison, not Lloyd in Milwaukee? Lloyd was in Madison. So, okay. They, they, the NAACP sent Lloyd to Milwaukee in, oh, in okay. 62, 63. Lloyd Barbie had been, was chairman of the Madison um, Commission on Human Rights before they, they created the Equal Opportunities Commission. Yes, yeah, so there's a picture in the book. Lloyd Barbie, 
Dave Obi and Jackie Robinson. It, 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 we're going to get you to in talk, a second. You talk yeah. about three great men. Yeah, we'll, we'll see yeah, that in a so, second. So telling people those creation stories of people, I, I mean, you know, you you were surprised to learn that Lloyd Barbie yep. had even had lived in Madison at this Because we, I, mean, yeah. I think we saw him, I think he came and spoke at some kind of a statewide yeah. fair housing conference or yeah. something. And I knew about him in Milwaukee. He's, he was involved with the ACLU. Yeah. But I, and then I didn't a state know he had legislator. a Madison history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, next one, please. So this was just a, a quote, and I'm not sure if we're going to read it from here, but it was Marshall Colston, I think, talking about the irony of of, uh, of things. And he was essentially saying, I think that you know, I don't want to, I don't want to force myself, you know, into a place. Oh, uh, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, you know, if somebody doesn't want me oh. there, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So anyway, the the, the 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 arc of this is that that's how they began. We the people were so put down that I think you know, taking what they could get yeah. was part of what they were looking for. There's a quote in there from Henry Reynolds, yep. um, who was mayor when, when they're writing this, saying, well, asking Harry Hamilton, why do you want to live where people don't want you? Right, exactly. And, and, but then Henry Reynolds becomes the one who pushes the Equal Opportunities Ordinance through. So maybe, you know, maybe he doesn't quite get it at the beginning. And there were so-called liberal labor leaders oh, who didn't, this, who were in this opposition is, to This it. is important. This is important. Yeah. And this, I was alluding to this earlier. And, and talking about the complexities of, of ascribing liberal conservative. The, the, because remember, the industrial labor unions supported civil rights. Hmm. The construction labor unions did not. Ah. Um, Walter Ruther and the UAW were hardcore, steadfast, solidarity for civil rights and, and doing the right thing. Um, because the production line is is one level of interaction. Yeah. But you know when you're up on a roof with a guy, or you're painting a house with a guy, and you're in the construction trades, or you're up on those high beams with a guy, um, and Babe Roar and the and the construction labor leaders were dead set against civil rights, mm -hmm. and Babe Roar um, and and all the labor and and this the State Journal supported the Equal Opportunities Ordinance. Hardcore. This is another thing that people will be surprised to see. Is the conservative state journal. The very conservative state journal and the very liberal Cap Times were together on fair housing. By the way, the Cap Times was really in its ascendancy then because the afternoon papers yeah. had, had been yeah. more subscribers. Oh, they, they were both so fat and heavy uh, with yeah. advertising. It was, it was a great era for newspapers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, the, and, and, but the state journal made great hay of poking fun at the Capital Times because all these liberals and these labor guys uh, that the Capital Times endorsed vote against the Fair Housing Code, yeah. whereas the conservatives, the Republican Bill Smith from the West Side and, and others who the state journal supported did support the Fair Housing Code. So the politics of civil rights in this era were very complicated. Absolutely. Next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, so the city housing This is 67. Um, the, the first fair housing code that the city passed in 1963, December 1963, was the first in the state, but it only applied to 40% of the housing because of the various exemptions. One of the exemptions being four or, or less units. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, are, the lo there are a lot of, lot of exemptions. And in 1967, under Mayor Otto Feske, um, they finally broadened it so it was almost universal. So I always wondered when we were doing fair housing law, when I was at the Tenant Resource Center yeah. for Housing, I said, where did this four or less unit thing came from? It was a compromise. It was, it was the a compromise. Thing it that was allowed the ordinance to pass. Right. Because um, it was what? A, a, a tie, basically, until that point. It, it had lost the first night. See, yeah. The way city government worked, um, just the actual operations, was, was much different. We, they had a, the city council had a thing called the Committee of the Whole. And the Committee of the Whole met on Tuesday, and the full council met on Thursday. And all the debate and the preliminary vote was on Tuesday. There was no debate, really, at the council meetings. Um, it was at the, city, at the Committee of the Whole. That's where the public hearings were. And the Committee of the Whole voted on everything as a recommendation to the council, and was usually adopted. The night that the Fair Housing Code was at the Committee of the Whole, the recommendation was against it. Madison killed the Fair Housing Code yeah. the first night, and then the supporters scrambled madly over the next 36 hours to come up with some compromise to get it through, and they came up, one of the things was this four units or less to, to protect the small. So essentially the Ma and Pa landlords The Ma and Pa didn't. things, the Ma and Pa okay. duplexes and fourplexes. Um, and, um, you know, exempting rumors in, when people took rumors in, right. because 
one of the women, uh, uh, Ethel Brown, the first woman on the, on the city council, had been elected in 1951. She's critical to this compromise, but she wants to maintain the exclusion for rumors, as Bill Smith says, because a lot of her faculty constituents have non-white don't want non-whites in their bathrooms. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So and by 1967... Now it's transgender bathrooms, yeah, but then yeah, it was... Yeah, yeah it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Next slide, please. Oh, the, you know, I think this is probably the 1968 clipping. Yeah, I believe so. Um, for all the difficulties that Madison has with, in the relations between its police department and its non-white community, Man, it's better than it used to be. So Tony Robinson it was preceded by a, a period where there was absolutely no trust. There were no black officers, and 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 a real strong case that totally disproportionate treatment of black people. When there were race riots, it was the, the black people that the, were arrested. The white people were ignored. There was there was a, an event at Bree Stevens Field in August 1968 that th there were a lot of racial fights in 1968. Pe people who think there's tension today will be flabbergasted. The, just almost weekly fights between whites and blacks, just racial fights. There were these teen dances that Wisdom put on at the Eastside Businessmen's Club on Monona Drive that the police chief shut down because these racial fights were spilling out onto the streets and up Atwood Avenue and down Monona Drive. Um, the, the, there, was a, there were no, no blacks on the police force in, until 1969. Johnny Winston Sr. Um, Johnny Winston Jr.'s father, of course. Um, in it's Mona's husband? I'm sorry? Mona's, yes. Yeah. Mona's, yeah. Um, and and, and the, the, the level of, of antagonism between the police department and, and the minority community was uh, just, just horrible. And, and, and the, so you, this, this Bree Stevens thing, I mean, so the, the, the black young people were out in the streets. They were defying the police. I mean, it's very reminiscent of Black Lives Matter, yeah. uh, you know, type things in the here and now. I mean, these, these kids were just saying, we're not going to put up with this. We yeah. don't care if you, your yeah. mom and dad have put up with it for years. Yeah. It, it's time for it to stop. Yeah. The, that's another subtext of, of the book. You know, the, I often quote Bob Dylan lyrics, of course, but, but there's a Rolling <laughs> Stones song that's very relevant. The singer's looking out on the kids playing in the park, doing things they think are new, I used to do. Right. Um, or doing things I used to do, they think are new. And when Black Lives Matter or Antifa or any of these groups heckle conservative speakers giving speeches or block traffic, they're doing things that the new left did in 67, yep. 68, 69. And some of the experiences that we had back then may be instructive to the kids today to see what works, what doesn't work, and, and for every, there's a dialectic here. And whatever you think about Marxism, th th as a Hegelian, there's a dialectic. And protest generates reaction, and reaction generates greater protest. And there's an escalation of, of this action-reaction that is very instructive. And, and the theme that people who are baby boomers today that probably participated in those things that's halted traffic that disrupted There's things. They're, they're upset now that the Black Lives Matter would do stuff like that, but they're, they're forgetting who they were and what they stood for. There's a picture in here of Paul Soglin sitting in front of a bus to block, the, <laughs> to, to block the, the wrong way bus lane on University Avenue. Paul Soglin sitting in the, uh, uh, in the corridor of the Commerce Building to stop. This is another thing. The, the, the implications of some of the protests that I want to say my people did Preventing people who want to interview with a particular employer yep. from doing so. That's a very profound, anti-democratic, almost fascistic approach to public policy. I'm not going to, li I think that what this company is doing is so heinous, and I think that we need to generate such a blowback. I'm not going to, you might want to become an engineer for Dow Chemical, I'm not going to let you have that opportunity to interview. Mm. That's a very profound thing. Yeah. Um, and and, to, and to, to sit down in front of the bus and say, no, this, bu this wrong way bus lane is too dangerous. We're going to use our people power. We're going we're to shut the system down and force you to change. That's, that's you know, I think they philosophically still had the profound. Wrong, I think they still had the wrong way bus lanes when I came in 78. And yeah. And, but, but I mean, just, I don't want to distract us from the civil rights struggle, but that, that was typical of, 
a, a city government that was deeply invested in the status quo. They, they yeah. did not want to change the wrong way bus line, even after people were being run down. Yeah. It clearly was a safety factor, but they just didn't want to for, give on that. We, we decided there was going to be this wrong way yeah. bus line, and that's the way it is. For, for, for people who, who are... Yeah. On University Avenue, it, when it goes to the campus, that wrong way bus lane on the south side of, of the University Avenue, that used to be a bus lane. Um, but now think about this, John. They, those plans were approved in 1960. Yeah. Everyone knew in 1960 and 61 and 62 and 63 and 64 and 65 and 66 that that wrong way bus lane had been there. But when it finally opens, and that's like, whoa. <laughs> wait, wait. Mm. So, so there's something to be said for people getting on the issue in, in the earth. This is why you go to committee hearings, because right. you stop things in committee. Once the, once the plan was published, once it was approved, once it was federally funded. Then they were going to change. How do they change? It's like, uh. wait a minute. We got, we got millions of dollars. This is part of this. This is part of, of the plan this is this is why the project was funded yep and and so they're they're you know they can't just say okay we'll change it now finally they did and they turned it into the bike lane that people had wanted you know 20 years earlier but yeah for for 25 years it was a wrong way bus lane so to bring it back next slide please yeah. i mean you know, i mean so what <laughs> there's so <laughs> that's many right there are too many, there's so many yeah. different threads we could explore but, uh, we uh, talked about we, this we talked earlier. About, yeah, we, we talked. Anyway, uh, yeah, let's let's move on. Yeah. We did talk about Muhammad, um, but um, another another yeah. person who is very prominent. What I was just going to say though is is this resistance to change. That's what inhibits um, you know advancements in civil rights. And yet there were people who were willing to model something different. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, this uh, being one of them. Velma, yeah. Velma and Harry Hamilton. Um, I I think the two most accomplished. You know, one of the one of the most accomplished uh, families in in Madison. You know, of, of any race. Uh, Harry was uh, editor of an organic chemistry journal, and wow. and Velma was was an English teacher. Um, yeah, I I had the great experience of knowing them both when I was president of the Bassett Neighborhood Association. Yeah, and uh, they were on the board, and of course um, they lived on Pontiac Trail. And when I moved to Nakoma, they were just a couple blocks away. So yeah, Harry and Velma, and I got a picture of Harry. Uh, at the debate where they're um, considering the, the Equal Opportunities Ordinance Next in 1963. Next slide, please. So Percy Julian. Percy Julian. Uh, someone who, we knew through for housing circles, someone who still is around yeah. doing important civil rights law. Well, uh, you know, in, in, in this era, he's one of the movement's primary lawyers, uh, the anti-war movement. So I got a photo of him uh, and Bob Cohen and uh, Show Rosen Weston and, and Carlos Jolly in court one day. Yeah, Percy, Percy was an important guy uh, on the legal side. We, we had, there were some good lawyers, and Percy was at the. At so the even though we were talking about 1,500 African Americans, roughly, I mean, these were people who were the spice in the stew. They were yeah. shaking up this community, yeah. and, and they were they were calling a question: Why don't black people want to move to Madison? Because of all these things, we want yeah. this to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Ah, Gene Parks, man. I've got... And why don't you go on to the next one after that, Mara. Just, uh, this is a young Gene Parks uh, student leader. Yeah. Um, there's a Gene Parks item every decade, every year. I mean, it's like the, Gene Parks, this is Gene at about 16. Um, Negro youth discovers people listen to him. And I guess Gene <laughs> kept talking, didn't he? And that started in high school. And that started in high school and, and, and continued on. And, and Gene is doing something newsworthy and noteworthy every year and by 1969 he gets elected to the city council and his second week in office he's arrested at the Mifflin block party riot yep. uh, along with Paul Soglin yeah Gene Gene was uh, an important guy in the decade it, it was important to me I mean like Jim Wright yeah. I mean he, he encouraged me but he he was seen as out there he was he was often discounted I think in contemporary Madison it's, it's what we often do yeah to, to people who are cutting edge yeah um, Gene, Gene was, in my period, Gene, Gene was doing some very righteous stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Next slide. And uh, just, to, just to mention Roar again. Um, yeah. So we'll get to Jim oh, Wright in yeah, a second. Okay, this is important. This shows, this is Jim Wright, this is Reverend J.M.C. Wright, uh, showing the dispersion of non-whites after the adoption of the Fair Housing Code. In 1963, I want to say there were seven aldermanic wards in the city of Madison that had no non-whites in them. Ah, wow. 
Um, and I've got the, I've got the breakdown of of non-whites by schools and non-whites by districts. Seven and out of the twenty some 20, automatic so, yeah. twenty one. Um, whatever, and, and, yeah. that, and that photo of Jim Wright showing how blacks were finally able to move out of South Madison, move out of uh, the Dayton Street area, move out of the Williamson Street area, and live where they wanted to live. Just two things to mention. One revelation was that before he became the executive director of uh, the MEOC at the end of '69, he was enrolled in Garrett Theological Seminary. He had left. He had gone away to, to yeah. But Garrett is where my mom and dad met in Maryland. Oh, how about I, that? I was born how in about, Evanston. How about so, that? Yeah, how about yeah. That? So yeah, Jim Wright had, yeah. had had. Now I never figured out what his health issues were because they, he had some very serious health issue yeah. in 1967. Misses his farewell party. Misses the debate on the Fair Housing Code goes to Garrett Theological Seminary, but then when they finally create the, the paid position in 1968, he comes back and becomes the first director. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I just mentioned, I, I mean, I, so in the mid 80s, I remember sitting down with Jim. I was, I, I just joined the Rainbow Coalition yeah. in 85, Tammy Baldwin and, ah. and, uh, and Charlie Daniel and Mary Kay Baum and George Swamp. And anyway, a lot of civil rights leaders were on that, but I was reticent to talk about my stories as a gay man in the context of the black civil rights movement or the rainbow coalition yeah. he just took me by the hand and he grabbed and he says you have a place at this table you have a right to tell your story you are part of the same struggle and in 1975 he and paul uh, helped pass the nation yeah. one of the nation's yeah. first uh, local yeah. gay rights ordinances yeah. i mean he, he got it from the yeah. very beginning yeah. and that that's a fascinating thing about your book is all these people that were way ahead of their time things that we think of as contemporary issues they were getting yeah. back in the 1960s yeah, yeah. Some of them were. Yeah. Yeah, yeah some. Not all. <laughs> some they actually had yeah, the opposite in ways yeah. that surprised us. Yeah. Next next slide, please. So okay. uh, so again, early nineteen sixties, uh, the Nashville lunch uh, counter demonstrations. My mom, by the way, uh, went to India as a missionary with Jim Lawson, who was uh, oh, launching these yeah, things yeah, in yeah, Nashville. Yeah, yeah. An important thing. So this, so uh, this yeah. is this is the Woolers on the Square. This is one month after the first sit-in in Greensboro. And people weren't being served in Madison lunch No, 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 that's not what's going on. No, people were being served. This this, this is just a supportive sit-in. This is a supportive sit-in, Yeah, this is just, yeah, and this is one of the issues is that Woolworths is going, hey, we're not discriminating, we're, you know, the the local The Woolworths on the square is not discriminating, the Kreskis isn't discriminating, but this was in support of the sit-in, okay. so, but so some people like Odell Taliaferro yeah. did not like this demonstration because because this owner was doing the right thing, so they should be they should not be disadvantaged or, or picketed because they're good guys. It reminds me of 2000 where we were saying the United Way should fund the Boy Scouts as long as they have a national discrimination policy. They were saying, but the local Boy Scouts it, doesn't it, believe this. Right. It's, it's right. Right. It's 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 the same issue. Well, um, yeah. The now another interesting thing about that that photo that's um the socialist club primarily that, that's doing that okay. and you know we haven't really said the words university of wisconsin often enough but so much of everything we understand about madison is a direct result of the university of wisconsin and it's the socialist club from from the university primarily grad students primarily out of state jewish grad students out of state jewish socialists when people talk about outside agitators yeah, <laughs> you know there, there were a few people who came few. to Madison from New York, for uh, example. Like a couple. <laughs> um, now there there were some homegrown people. Um, Franklin Peterson, right? Um, Frank Peterson was was from Wisconsin, but a lot of the political agitation um, of the early '60s and through the mid '60s um, is out of state students, primarily East Coast and, and Illinois Jews. And, and there were folks who were using that mm -hmm. mantra that, oh, well, these are outside agitators, yeah, so they yeah. shouldn't be listened to. Right, right, right. And, and we and we should cut enroll cut out of state enrollment even though they were paying full weight. Um, the, interesting, Saul Landau, who was the head of the Fair Play for Cuba um, group. World famous the, filmmaker, dozens well, of films. Right, right. Uh, graduated did, in the 50s, yeah, from UW. Now, it, now th there, there was a great division within socialists and communist party members on how close to get to the civil rights movement because they said red and black don't mix. And there were a lot of communists and socialists and we have to acknowledge that a lot of the people who were involved in leftist activities in Madison in the early 60s in the anti-war movement were communists. Yep. I mean, I mean, it's just, you know, a fact. But Saul Landau did not want to participate in this in this demonstration. But once it was called, he said, well, I'm a go uh, yeah, the people have decided. So he's out there. But it, it was very interesting to look back and see the 
and there are already inklings of the relationship with Cuba and people getting, yeah. uh, getting the first the first disruptive demonstration of the yep. of the decade is Goldwater conservatives breaking up a meeting of the Socialist Club in support of Fidel and Cuba in the immediate aftermath of the Bay of Pigs. Yep. So, so when people say, you know, it's wrong to disrupt a political protest, and I agree it's wrong to disrupt a political uh -huh. protest, the first ones to do it were Goldwater conservatives, and they should own that. And the guy who brought peace to that chaotic event was Ed Garvey, who, who was, was at that point going from president of the WSA to, to the NSA. All right. So let's, let's keep There's on going. There's so many interconnections. Th there <laughs> are. There's a lot to cover here, and we'll see how much yeah. further we can get into it here in our time. So you ah, mentioned this photo. Yeah. Um, Lloyd Barbie on the left, Jack, Jackie Robinson, and Dave Obie. So Dave Obie was our neighbor in Wausau when yeah. I was four years old. Oh. Uh, Dave and Joan came for a, a tribute to George McGovern five years ago because yeah. they said they remembered my mom and dad. And oh, they wanted nice. to. I, just the other thing is, in 1969, when we lived in New London, Dave was running, you know, he, he was filling Mel Laird's seat because he'd just been appointed Secretary of Defense. My parents found eight Democrats in New London. He still remembered that wow. 30 years later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dave, Dave, now here he is as chairman of the campus committee so, for Hubert Humphrey. And he's he's a peer of Dave's Weefel. They're in college together. Right, so right. there are a lot of people that are important in the you know in the here and now that were young student leaders back when. Uh, you know, longevity is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Jack, let's explain who Jackie Robinson ja is. Jackie Robinson, as they say, um, a credit to his race, the human race. Jackie Robinson, yep. the, the uh, ball, he integrated Major League Baseball with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947, um, a great civil rights leader, uh, a re pretty much a Republican because in the 40s and 50s and early 60s, the Republicans were better on civil rights than the Democrats were. Yep. And Jackie, okay, so this event is a, is a rally for uh, Hubert Humphrey for president. Hubert Humphrey running in 1960 primary, a great civil rights leader. It was really much more popular than Kennedy at oh, first. Oh, yeah. Kerry, he won the primary. Because and he was he's, our, kind of our second senator. He's next door, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so Dave Obie, as a good liberal, is, is head of the Humphrey campaign. And Jackie Robinson is, is here for this event. And he's speaking on behalf of, of Humphrey. And some reporter says, well, what are you going to do if uh, Humphrey doesn't get the nomination and it's Kennedy? And Jackie Robinson goes, I'll probably vote for Nixon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> did, did not make Dave Hale be happy. So just mentioned briefly, so, so uh, you were mentioning communists and other folks who came, the intersection with the Black Civil Rights Movement. W.E.B. Du Bois came to Madison w. E. B. in the W.E.B. Du Bois comes. Um, A senior thesis was on Bill Du Bois. Oh, so, yeah. and, and, and speaks uh, to the yeah. Socialist Club. gives it, And then they take him out for dinner at Troya's Steakhouse. Now, the notion of W.E.B. Du Bois chowing down at Troya, the yes. Troya's Steakhouse is like, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but Du Bois was a real proponent of, of Russian and, and Chinese communism at yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and, we let, and yeah. he spoke on campus because you could do that in those days. Yeah. Incidentally, Dave Obey was a study, uh, was a student of Chinese and Russian um, uh, language and, and, uh, and politics. Oh, By the okay. way, he, he might have become a yeah. professor in that yeah, field yeah, yeah, had yeah, he not. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the other interesting, we, the, we, we got to give a shout out to at least three of the history faculty. We got to okay. at least say, we got to talk about Harvey Goldberg and- I took glasses from when I first came here. And, and George Mossy. I also took glasses and, and, from and, him. And Bill Williams. Yep. And I've been taking Bill Cronin's uh, Making the American Landscape course as a guest auditor. So I'm now enrolled in the history department. So I feel myself in, in the link of Frederick Jackson Turner, Fred Harvey Harrington, George Harvey and Bill, Bill and then me. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's great. But George Mossy, um, all, all these, all these history, history, history professors were so instrumental in developing the minds and the analytical skills of the people who would go on to essentially bring the, the, the system down. Harvey, Fred Harvey Harrington hired the hist history professors who would end up bringing Fred's presidency down by creating all this unrest in 65, 66, 67, 68, 69. It's almost Shakespearean. You had a quote from Mossy, I think, one of the early demonstrations yeah. in the library mall that wasn't organized by Goldwater Republicans. Yeah. Him just saying, this is an educational opportunity yeah. for well, our students. You know, wh whether, whether they should march or rally, and, the, and the, uh, the fascinating story of Bill Steiger taking the radical approach and Ed Garvey taking the moderate approach on whether or not to have a rally or a march, but George Mossy saying, Whatever they do, the students will learn something, and, and, th and this will be good for the students. We thought of George about 10 years ago when um, the Holocaust Museum brought an, ex uh, an exhibit on gays in the Holocaust yeah. here. 
because he was both a gay man yeah. and also um, and someone obviously who who was a student of the lessons of what why Nazi Germany should not mm -hmm. be repeated in this country now. Yeah, we um, need him now. And then Harvey Goldberg. I mean, what what a what a character! And, and they were contrasting and, other yeah. more mellow people with. I mean, Harvey was just was out so there, and, and, and he was a. He was just, he was theatrical too in his lectures. And the irony of when the Radical History Students Association starts shutting down classes to, to, to you know, to talk. The first class they shut down is Harvey's. Yep. They, you know, Michael David Rosen, for, you know, from SDS goes in and shuts down Harvey's class. Because he wasn't radical enough. Or? They wanted a critique of, it was like, well, we're not uh. going to talk about, you know, you know, the, the uh, Engl English peasant system today. We're going to talk about what's going on today. At the Mifflin Block Party rally. Now, where do faculty live? Faculty live on the west side. They live in University Heights. Where did, where did Harvey Goldberg live? 521 West Dayton Street. Oh, Harvey Goldberg really? lived in Mifland. And when the cops are bombarding Mifflin um, with tear gas at the Block Party riot in May 1969, they pumped tear gas right into Harvey's apartment. Oh, wow. So it's like, you know, he's like, why are we doing this? Oh, it's hard. <laughs> So I think we're going to whet people's <laughs> appetites. We're going to just have to have a longer discussion yeah. at some point when time and space permits. Let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so oh. we, just, we want to remind people about your the book, book again, <laughs> since we are midway through the show and, and or a little more there. Yeah. But um, yeah, once again, um, uh, uh, you oh, know. Uh, it, let me say something about that. Yeah, please the go ahead. In the, the photo in the lower left, I find this is, is tragic. I, someone at the, at the launch party last night told me who that woman was and unfortunately she passed away a couple of months ago but her daughter is still alive and her daughter is, is aware that the picture is on the book so we find she's living down down in illinois so we said this before but it really is a living work in the sense that people react to it yeah. respond to it yeah. add to it and i and i keep learning N not only do i gain new insights each time i think about it but people tell me things it's like oh here here's here's what you didn't oh you know so yeah it's, it's very very so you mentioned you're probably not going to revise it substantially next time around, but are you keeping track of this, referring yeah. people to the yeah. historical society? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so everything that's that's grown out of the book will yeah. be preserved. And, and and I'm also referring people to some of the sources that I used. I mean, I had the great advantage of, you know, I'm writing in the, it's both an advantage and, and, and a danger, writing about Dow in the shadow of David Marinus, writing They Marched Into Sunlight. Um, Matt Levin wrote this great, if people are interested in, Further details on the socialist and communist politics of the era on campus. Matt Levin wrote this great book called Cold War University. David Mollenhoff and Mary Jane Hamilton wrote th a spectacular book on Monona Terrace. So there are a number of books that, that are identified uh, that people can go to for further even greater detail. So part of the power of what you're doing, because you're you're reaching a, a, a large audience, probably larger than usually embraces theory, themes like of history like this, is again, you're a catalyst for bringing all kinds of other people into it. I just want to mention in passing, we talked about this when I called in an Alan Ruff show. Um, you know, I think I think another dimension to take this to is to take it into the schools, take yeah, it into younger yeah, people. Yeah. I, and I, I, I don't think I loaded these shots in, but I went down to Soma three years ago there was something called the foot soldiers breakfast. So you had all these people who were in their late teens and their 20s, kind of peers of John Lewis and yeah. Diane Nash on the level of yeah. Selma, that were talking to people who are young people today, and which is what yeah. you were saying. We've got to remind young people, you may just be a teenager or in your 20s now, but historically, yeah. your age group yeah. has has achieved yeah. massive change. Yeah. You can yeah. do it now. Yeah. Um, but. But some, but young people can also be really, really wrong. There, there's a photo in the book of the buses loading up um, in front of the Memorial Union on their way to Selma. Yep. And there are these two knuckleheads on the balustrade with a Confederate flag. Oh my God. And and I and I debated for a moment. And I said, No, of course you put that photo in the book. You put that photo in the book to remind people. Yeah, there are knuckleheads who, in front of people who are. Risking their lives, yeah. Risking getting their heads not, you know, kicked open by getting on this bus and going to Selma and Montgomery. And you knuckleheads are up there with the Confederate flag. Yeah, we're going to remind people that you're out there. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, I think we now may be moving into uh, uh, different. Oh, women. oh. Uh, so here's Leah Zeldin. Leah Zeldin, you're, you know, speaking out. You, you talked on Alan's show a lot about how important she was. She was very important in my life. Go to the next slide if you could. 
this was the photo that was pictured on her memorial that I yes. took at, at Barbara Wright's restaurant. Yeah. And, and the symbolism here that I didn't even think of at the time was the empty chair that Leo was constantly inviting people in. She was not only someone who preached the, the, the righteous message of civil rights and social justice, she was willing to listen well into her later years. Yeah, but let me, t yeah. But there's another Look, side to Leia too. she was not willing to listen to <laughs> Senator Edward Kennedy. Oh, and, interesting. And this is, 1966 is the, is the year that every, everything changed. In, well, in 1965, 1965 is the fulcrum in which the focus shifts from civil rights to the war. Because the passage of the Voting Rights Act makes people think, okay, we've done something meaningful, let's, you know, and civil rights starts to recede as a national issue just as President Johnson starts bombing North Vietnam. Yeah. So 1965 is, is, is the shift. That's when the Committee to End the War in Vietnam forms on campus. In the spring of 1966, there's an anti-draft protest, a sit-in at the administration building that is wildly successful. Everybody loves it. The regents think it's great. The administration thinks it's great. Everyone behaves themselves. They don't accomplish really what they want, but it's a popular event. Nobody gets offended. Six months later, Senator Ed Kennedy is coming to Madison to give a talk for our friend Pat Lucy, who's lieutenant governor running for, for governor. Now, Pat Lucy is anti-war, pro-student. He's a liberal Democrat. He's pro-civil rights. He's a good guy. He's on. The, he's a. He's the. He's he'll, the good he'll guy. Bring the Democratic Party back into where it was. He's the Gaylord good guy. Nelson and and, yeah. and Ted Kennedy's here to give a talk on his behalf. Now, Evan Stark and the Committee to End the War in Vietnam had decided nobody from the federal government is going to be allowed to speak on this campus, ah. and because they thought they were going to come talk about the war. Ted Kennedy wasn't here to talk about it. He was here to talk about Pat Lucy. And there were 3,000 people in the stock pavilion. And the committee to end the war in Vietnam had people on the podium behind Kennedy with their bring the troops home now signs. And they had people out in the audience to heckle Ted Kennedy. Yeah. Now a degree of heckling is okay. But then Leah starts up, I have four sons. I don't want them to die in Asia. I, and, she, and she keeps up. People throw a coat on her head. She throws it off and keeps going. Leah Zeldin yeah. and, and Robin David and the others drive Ted Kennedy from the stage. Wow. He gives up and leaves the stage. This is not a popular event. 8,000 mm. students sign a letter of apology. Now, you know... This the, was not long after JFK's assassination. This, this is October 66. And, of course, his brother Bobby was coming to this and see Teddy was a relatively young man. Yeah, but, and, and, yeah. and, and this, this was such a misguided event. And, and, okay. and I think it was one of the events that started to turn public opinion to make people think, what is wrong with those people? Uh -huh. why, why, th th this was a counterproductive action. And, it's, and, and it's, it's hard as a historian to come to a, a conclusion that people you admire and people who are friends of yours right. have done something that didn't work. People are very complicated. And, 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 and it's like, well, you know, as a historian, I have, to, I have to tell the truth. This event didn't work. Just so we can do it briefly, though, yeah. uh, we, we haven't mentioned who Leah was and what she did do, uh, do in terms of being a leader Le in Le amazing Le ways. Le Leah and a woman named Bortai Scudder and, yep. and uh, Evan Sark and some others were committed in the war in Vietnam and the Committee for Direct Action, you know, trying to arrest the, co the base commander at yep. Truex and going into the churches and standing silently on the sides at, at Good Friday. And, and no, Leah was, was a very, Leah and Bortai Scudder and, and a couple others were, were very important in 64, 65, 66, um, but not all their actions, I think, Work. I did a radio show on Leah, Midge Miller, and uh, Becky Young, because oh, they had all passed yeah. within the f yeah. same few months. Yeah. And it was interesting to contrast the different styles, because they each had a, had a place. Right, the, the ones who played within the system and the ones who played outside the system. Right. And, and when it worked, it worked, and, and, but it didn't always work. And, and you have to, you have to uh, you know, accept that and acknowledge it. It's just one of the traditions she carried through into um, the, the recent times is, is a Martin Luther King Day, very yeah. egalitarian dinner, yeah. a potluck essentially. Yeah. And that's how we honored her yeah. at her memorial yeah. was a potluck in yeah. that tradition. Yeah. Yeah. And she was also in, uh, instrumental in a controversy involving the schools because her son Robin had a mustache uh -huh. and the schools didn't let boys have facial hair in, in, in the late 1960s and they suspended him. Yep. And, and then, so Leah goes to court and, and she gets an injunction and, and, and the, the whole thing, you know. So on one hand, she's dealing with 
war and peace and civil rights. Uh, she's also dealing with whether or not her son can have a mustache. Well, so it's, it's also a lot like the Kalen family. There's a multi-generational yeah. dynamic of the kids, the grandkids yeah. are still carrying on the legacy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Next, next uh, slide, if you could. Uh, so, oh. uh, uh, yeah, Alicia Ashman. Ali Ashman, the second woman to be elected to the Mass and Common Council, elected the same day as Paul Soglin in 1968. The 1968 election was such a sea change. Um, I th nine new alders on, on a 21-member on a 21 21 member city council, n you know, including Ali Ashman, um, who, your classic West Side liberal, League of Women Voters, Capital Community Citizens, you know, all those do-gooder groups, and, and, and what a force of energy and, and uh, progressive guidance she was. Interestingly enough, someone, I don't know if it was her, that, that first woman, uh, but we're arguing that more women ought to be elected because women have more time on their hands because they don't have jobs. <laughs> so uh, a little... Yeah. Uh, Ali, Ali Ashman tried to bail Paul Soglin out uh, when he was arrested the second day at Mifflin and the jailers wouldn't take her check. Yep. Um, so that's that's when uh, Ed Durkin and the firefighters stepped up and paid Paul's bail. Uh, what I want to get into is, is, is Kay Clarenbach, oh, um, which yeah. I think is up next with any luck. Yes. Yeah. Kay. Um, and Mara, why don't you go on to the next slide just to bring this a little more into the here and now. Among other things, yeah. Kay was also David Clarenbach's mother. Kay, one of the founding members of the National Organization of Women. Um, she was the original chair. Original, uh, original treasurer and 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 chair. Yeah, original chair. And she she was there at the founding. I mean, she she and and um, uh, uh, Gloria Gloria Steinem Stein and and um, uh, Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan. Uh, so I Betty, Betty Midler. Betty Friedan <laughs> were, were there at Washington, and they said, "Let's have you know." And N O W. Yeah. So so Kay was very important. Kay. Um, I got a picture of Kay in the book that I'm, I was proud to be able to to include. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, people ask about how much women, women's liberation and women's issues, there is, and women's liberation, the women's movement was a very late 60s thing. Yeah. It, 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 it was not continuing, and the anti-war movement was very sexist. Um, you know, you just th think of, of, of that poster with Joan Baez and Mimi Farina and another woman, they're sitting there, girls say yes to boys who say no, mm. you know? Um, and yeah. w you know, chicks up front. You know, uh, th you know, the anti-war movement was not hospitable to women's involvement. By the late 19, uh, there, there's an event where where there's a protest against uh, uh, the ROTC orientation, and and a group of women d do do a, an event one day to invade this classroom and, and harass. And one of the women um, says, well, after this, we're going to have a meeting to talk about women's liberation issues. And it's the first instance I can find of the actual phrase, women's liberation movement. Uh -huh. uh, and that's, that's you know, 1969. Just a quick tangent. When uh, Nan Cheney was on this show about yeah. Midge Leia and, uh, and uh, Becky, and she tells a story of, of chauffeuring uh, Bella Abzug around town yeah. about this era. Yeah. And she said, Bella would not shut up. So she just pulled her over and said, I want you to listen to me for a while. But, <laughs> but, but she also talked about Midge. And Midge is much beloved. Of course, she yeah. wasn't elected to office until 71. So yeah. that's maybe why that's the next book that yeah, gets done. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. We mentioned her. But, but Midge also had a reputation of really trusting people's arms and getting them to do things. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, that, and, and, but that was the nature of who yeah, she was and what, what she needed to do. Th yeah, that's why we need those people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but yeah, just to mention, so I mean, there are a lot of folks who were doing things in the 60s, but for various reasons, Midge is a case in point. I mean, really, her ascendancy into elected office and everything happened in the 70s. Yeah, so you yeah. had to make a lot of difficult choices, I would imagine. Well, I, I had one absolute prime directive was that the book ends on 1231-69. Yep. Um, the, the way I dealt with the future is if somebody um, was elected to office or had some high honor or did something, I'd put brackets. So, you know, we meet Paul Soglin as, you know, an undergraduate running for the WSA, but we got bracketed, you know, Alderman, Mayor of Mass, and so on and so forth. For Midge, you know, we've got the brackets about what she would uh, end up doing, but, you know, the book had to end. And, and the book could cover everything. I was, I yeah. was curious about some of the people who were important in my life, like Joe Elder. And Joe, Joe, you mentioned, but, but you know, but of course, but, the arc of his career yeah. extended over 60 years. But, but, the, but, the, but the thing is that it, had to be, what they did had to be important to Madison. Sure. And and there were people at the especially at the university. So Joe was mediating disputes between the Vietnams and Yeah, yet. yeah, yeah. I, I mean <laughs> yeah. I, I was looking for that I mean I, right. and, and I had I had to make sure 
I there's forty thousand words on the floor, John. Right, I know, I know. I, I, mean, I saw this process. I mean, I mean, <laughs> the book. I mean, the book's one hundred and seventy thousand words right. as it is, but there's forty thousand on the floor. What I'm coming back to is that theme that this is a catalyst. Then there are deeper yeah. explorations yeah. that can happen. Yeah. There are early histories that can be examined. Yeah, yeah. Um, and next slide, please. So, oh, uh, what's interesting about this is this is a this is Dorothy Castermeyer, Bob Castermeyer's wife, but. If you read that caption, you will not learn that her name is Dorothy. Hey, she's Mrs. Mrs. Robert, Mrs. Castemeyer. Because, right. Because, and, and, and to see the growth over time of, of, the, sen of, of the journalistic stylings and, and how by the end of the decade, she's, she's going to be, she's Dorothy. What I was delighted to find this because when I did my interview with Dave Zwiefel about Bob Castemeyer, I couldn't find anything on Dorothy. Yeah. And it, it struck me that all of the great men who achieved things, they had a spouse who was behind them 100% that really contributed to who they were. They were their confidants. And, yeah. and, and Dorothy's story, because she was behind the scenes, she didn't yeah. want to have the spotlight. It wasn't often told. Dorothy is such a quiet, you know, she's a beauty queen from Nagadoches, Texas. Oh, really? Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, I, had, I had the great privilege of covering Bob when I was in Washington. Bob was the main guy. I covered so I I think I've written more stories about Bob Castmeyer than anybody in history, and I got to I got to meet Dorothy a bit, and she was here. She was in town just very recently for the for the Castmeyer lecture that that Justice Abrahamson gave, and it was a real pleasure to see her again. Yeah, and he was the first major politician I got to know yeah. in the in the context of fair housing yeah. and, and getting his yeah. his help on that, and and then getting to talk to Paul Rusk and getting yeah. and and Helen P. Kellick yeah. and other people who worked yeah. with him. Yeah, 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 what a yeah. blessing. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the stuff he does on copyright and intellectual freedom, yeah, yeah, is, yeah. Is, yeah. that's later, but yeah. that, that's, yeah, yeah. But, but he is woven into many aspects of your book. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Shirley yeah. Abramson, and um, let's go on to the next slide. Do we have the picture of her with the dogs? Yeah. yeah. Um, that may be my favorite photo. When I found this photo, it's like, oh boy, did I hit. When, when, when Shirley um, became partner with, well, actually when she was hired, by the LaFollette firm. This was so, un a girl lawyer, that um, uh, Gordon Sinekin did all this PR, and Gordon Sinekin got the State Journal to do this whole takeout on Shirley, and there's this, there are like 30 photos of Shirley walking her dogs, and Shirley in the law library, and Shirley cooking dinner, and it's Shirley looking like Donna Reed with pearls on, and she's making minute rice, and she's looking assiduously at the directions. <laughs> Shirley, it's minute rice. There are no directions. <laughs> um, yeah, Shirley Abra I mean, when you say when you ask people, how do you know Madison special? Because our Fair Housing Code was written by a future Chief Justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. That's why we're special. So flash ahead to 1987. <laughs> part of her legacy is part of what gave you the foundation to amend the, or to create the county Fair Housing Code. Right, ordinance. right, yeah. Sure, Shirley Abrahamson, as as a, as a Madison person, even before she's a statewide and a national person, yeah. Can I bend your ear for about ten or fifteen more minutes, or sure. are we stretch your sure. things? All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> oh, this is uh, and during the Dow rally. Th this this is the night after uh, the Battle of Dow, where where police uh, forcefully evict with with truncheons and and sticks. Uh, Billy Clubs, the uh, protesters who were blocking the Dow interviews. I'm not sure if we explained that. Could you give us a okay. description of what Dow was about? Okay. Dow Chemical Company made napalm, a flaming gel for use in Vietnam. And the, the radical, uh, a coalition of radical groups decided that they were going to block job interviews. And, and, you know, job interviews on campus, a big deal, all the, all, mainly the natural sciences, you know, an, an industrial firm. So they come looking for engineers. They're going to have job interviews on campus. The radicals say, no, we're not going to let you interview on campus because you may, you know, inter interview off campus. Do like they do in other cities. You're not welcome on our campus. We're going to shut down the, the job interviews. The first day, there's an informational picket. The second day, they're blocking. They're in the hundreds of people blocking the Commerce Building Corridor, including Paul Soglin and others, to prevent the job interviews. Cops come in with billy clubs. <laughs> Bloodying people, throwing them out. Cops go out in the the um, plaza of the of the courtyard in front of what's now the Ingraham Building. It was the Commerce Building back then. There are thousands of people out there because it's class break, and 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 they and they see all their classmates coming out bloodied, and they start throwing things. And the cops, you know, unleash tear gas. The first use of tear gas on a college campus to quell an anti-war campus is on our campus. Police brutality becomes 
a big issue. That the image that we just saw was thousands of people um, having a nighttime rally, trying to figure out what to do. And what's important about that photo is not so much what they're going to do the next day, but what it symbolizes on how how politics worked back then. Because mm -hmm. if they were 18 or 19 or 20, they couldn't vote. Yeah. All they could do was be in the streets. 18 year old vote didn't come until the early it's, 70s. It's, I would say it's under Nixon, yeah, I, yeah. I say 72, you know, and, and then Soglin's mayor election of 73 is because that's the first 18 year old vote. Yeah. And if you look back, you see these public hearings. We talked about the auditorium before. There was a public hearing on a referendum, which we also talked about, to kill Monona Terrace in 1960. A thousand people came to the public hearing. The city was half its size today. That's the equivalent of 2,000 people in today's Madison attending a public hearing. That would be like filling Overture Hall with for a public hearing. Yeah. We saw thousands of people out in the, in the library mall because that's the only way they could, they could express themselves was in groups of thousands of people. So the other thread off of this is, is this was essentially a lot of the activism was centered around what is the UW doing to yes. perpetuate war? Yes. You mentioned late in the 60s, early roots of Carlton Armstrong's actions. The, 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 the bombs the, that were potentially entered, uh, were, were that didn't explode, that, that you know, were attempted yeah. on the Baraboo Munitions uh, yeah. factory. And, and But I mean, of course, that all led up to something beyond the Army scope math. of your book in 1970. Army math. Um, bombing of Sterling Hall. The, the work that Jim Rowan, who would go on to become Paul Soglin's administrative assistant. Later a political and, science, and, uh, 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 rather uh, 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 a reporter great, uh, for the uh, Milwaukee uh, Journal yeah. Sentinel. Also John Norquist, chief of staff as mayor of Milwaukee. The work he did to expose the military university complex. You know, Dwight Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex. Jim Rowan's expose in the Cardinal of the military university complex exemplified by the Army Math Research Center right. um, and the work it was doing, much of it classified, would have the tragic consequences uh, in 1970. But yeah, the, the, the continued back and forth of what is the proper role of the university in the larger national context? Is it to cooperate with the national government and if the national government identifies this degree, this area of research as important should the University of Wisconsin a land grant university cooperate and participate or should it have um, a different set of values and say no we're not going to do that research we're not going to cooperate with the draft when when the radicals tried to get the university to stop cooperating with the draft system and provide class rankings and provide um, test scores on part, it was noble by saying, we don't want student deferments. We think that the privileged sons of the middle class should not have an exemption. We should be subject to the same war pressures as the poor blacks and the poor browns are as a way to end the war. But the flip side of that is, I'm telling you that you should not have a deferment. That mm -hmm. just because, that even though you're in college, you should not have a deferment. And, and the Would more you like it to almost fascist instincts, or, or just I'm, I'm saying it's a very self-righteous. Okay. Um, the dogma of the left the, can the be dogma, very much like the dogma of the right. The sometimes. dogma of the left saying, "I am going to make it. I'm going to make you more subject to the draft." Mm. I mean, the implications of that again are profound, and 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 the the the, the self-righteousness of look, our moral imperative. Right. Uh, 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 Robin Fleming and. and compared the the moral imperative self-righteousness of the left to the Klan and the Chinese Red Guard. Or to move beyond nonviolence into advocating and actually executing violence. Yeah. Uh, the, the, like I say, the, 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 the book doesn't draw a lot of those conclusions. Yeah. The book presents the facts. And if you're thinking about it, um, maybe you'll say, Okay, what are the implications of that? And I think the next book I'm going to write is going to be talking about the lessons that I've drawn from this because I've been I've been living in this milieu for three years, and each as I say each time I talk about it, I understand more about what it meant. And some people on on our side are going to regard this as a revisionist history, interesting, because it's going to say because it says we did this and they did that. Yeah. I mean the the rule. And here's how it all ties together. The rule they enforced by calling in the cops at Dow 
yeah. was the anti-obstruction rule they passed in response to Leah Zeldin heckling Ted Kennedy off uh, the stage. Interesting. There is a direct line between the protest in 1967, 66, and the protest in 1967, exactly one year later, yeah. almost to the week. And, and it, 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 the interconnectivity, the formative liter literary experience of my life is remembrance of things past. Mm -hmm. I see things in multiple generations. When I'm talking to you now, I see you when we were both in our fair housing days. Well, the past is not past. It's uh, and, and, the science and, and, fiction and other places. As, as, as William Faulkner said, right. the past isn't dead. It isn't it's even the past. past. Right. And, and to see this interconnectivity of this is what happened in 1966, and this is what happened in 1967, and it's the same event. Yeah. And what are the lessons we draw from this? I mean, that's why this is exciting. And, and I, we may get to this, but 1963, 68, the, the, you know, I mean, those years we are reliving in many yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just the last thing, because I'm going to show him this show, and I, I want to make sure he realizes this, but Jim Rowan is one of my the people I would love to have in that chair because yeah, he has yeah, Jim, Jim Rowan. Su Susan's one of my best friends, so yeah. I got to know him mostly through there, and I, I got to attend George's funeral. So. Yeah, um, yeah. George McGovern was his father-in-law. Yeah, uh, and yeah. And, and George is in the book, and Susan's yeah. a Susan McGovern was one of the women to sign the the We Won't Go ad. That's right. In, yeah. in 19, you know, I, I spoke about the sexism of the movement, and there was a very big deal in February 1967. We won't go is a number of people, including Jim Rowan and others, stating they were going to break the law and they were going to advocate other people to break the law and not comply with the draft. And a couple, and a short while later, there was, a, there was another ad that included women, including Susan McGovern. Um, I, 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 yeah. I think we're going to scroll through yeah. pictures maybe three seconds at a time, okay. and then we'll give you a chance to summarize so we okay. get you out of here and our producer <laughs> onto our next task. Oh, but, this, but oh, this, this, is, this yeah. I do want to mention. Actually, this is worth spending some more yeah. time on. And one more slide, if you could. So this is the, the Greek silent march. This is the, the silent Greek march in 1962. Th the university was very good about trying to force fraternities and sororities to live by non-discrimination. And they had a, a number of, of resolutions that the faculty imposed. And one of them was that alumni could not have a, a particular role in choosing members because mm -hmm. they had a number of these uh, uh, fraternities had prohibitions on blacks and prohibitions Jews. Prohibitions on blacks and, and Jews, absolutely. And so the, and the university is cracking down. And in 1962, the largest civil rights action of the date. I think probably the largest civil rights action until the late 60s was 1,200 sorority and fraternity members marching from Langdon Street to Bascom Hill down to State Street and home um, to protest the university cracking down and forcing them uh, to, 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 to comply with all the civil it, rights We, we don't think about frats and sororities and being on the cutting edge of social change. Although in 1989, when we had our big, first big yeah. LGBT march, Almost universally, the frats and sororities came out to cheer us on. Well, so in this era, they were not. And it, at, at this point, the editor of the Daily Cardinal was Jeff Greenfield, and someone phoned in a ABC couple of commentator, media commentator, big, yeah. big time guy, yeah. getting death threats because uh -huh. because the Daily Cardinal was so aggressive in pushing the the civil rights enforcement action. Um, Daily Cardinal was also against postseason football games and, and, and called on abolishing the Rose Bowls. They also got upset when boxing was abolished. Yeah, right? yeah. So, the, but, uh, you know, the, oh, the level of the journalism of the Daily Cardinal yeah. was staggering. I mean, Jeff Greenfield, Lowell Bergman, Peter, Ber uh, Peter Greenberg, um, on and on, just, you know. Yeah, it's one of my greatest. Walt Bogdanich, I mean. My I wrote about a half dozen articles for them, but I, I wish I had got better you know, engagement. Whit Whitney what an Gould, tradition. I mean, the number of Pulitzer yeah. Prizes that have come out of Daily Cardinal reporters is like staggering. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's, let's go on with our plan to just kind of scroll through yeah. a few things. Um, I, oh, so, so I did want to mention this hearing that occurred at First Bob's United Head. Methodist Church, and you go to the next. Yeah. Just oh, to, and, 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 and but the reason yeah. they weren't in the city council building right. was because Babe Rohr was chairman of the building commission and wouldn't let Bob Kastmar so, have, a have a meeting in the city hall. So Dave Zwiefel, uh, just to, yeah, so we get a Bob shot Kastmar. of the, first, or the front part of him, but yeah. um, Dave Zwiefel mentioned this as this really important moment because yeah. nobody else was doing this, having yeah. a local locally based hearing on the yeah. Vietnam War. He was yeah. just way ahead of his time. Yeah, um, and th those hearings were published as a book, Voices from the Grassroots, Citizens Speak on Vietnam, I have a copy of. 
Yeah, a number of people spoke uh, at that at that. But this uh, was this hearing. was 63, 64. This is 65. 65, but it still was way ahead. Oh, it was totally ahead. the curve ahead. of yeah, almost yeah, any yeah, other yeah, Congress yeah. people. Yeah, or it was July 65. Um, but Babe Rohr wouldn't let it take place in in the city county building, and the state assembly wouldn't take place. So he's finally in the Methodist Church. Babe Rohr, 14th District, yeah. Southside, opposed uh, black nightclubs, yeah. uh, fair housing, yeah. other things. But by 1971, yeah. Babe turns on the war and, and and is featured in the New York Times as a, as a labor leader against the war. You're making this far too complicated. <laughs> How can these <laughs> the, villains this, become? The, this is the thing. This is the yeah. thing. Is is that you know Walt Whitman was right. We could we could contain <laughs> multitudes. Well, and, and John Lewis talks about the guy who beat him 50 years before yeah. and who got down on his knees and begged forgiveness, yeah. and then they hugged. Yeah. And he says, people can change. If they can't, we're in big trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Next slide, please. Uh, so just we, you mentioned this in passing, but the entertainment is uh, up, up upper left is Nancy Wilson. She sang at my cousin's wedding. Okay. So I will always have a special place and she, in my heart. And, and, and she, she did a homecoming. But Nancy Wilson in Harper's Bazaar in 1967. You got Ella Fitzgerald in the yeah. other corner, but you also have Bob Hope. And you I, yeah. I think another one, uh, Buck, uh, the Buckaroos. Oh, and, the, oh and, how, uh, about, how about this? Quicksilver Messenger Service for free in Great Hall the same day that Country Joe and the Fish are playing that night at the Stock Pavilion. So everybody I mean, come was on. coming through Madison. It was the, amazing. The, the, the homecoming, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Glenn Miller Orchestra, Bob Hope, Maynard Ferguson. Yeah. Next we slide. We bring back homecoming. I, I think we bring up your hero next. Yes. Yeah, Bob. Didn't sell out the Orpheum. Now, you, 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 you devoted, you already alluded to yeah. some of these stories, but you devoted a substantial part of this. And, and yeah, we haven't made this clear. Bob Dylan Bob is, D Bob, is, Bob is, Dylan, your, is your icon. I mean, Bob your, Dylan is the greatest own. singer songwriter since Homer. <laughs> let's, let's get that out on the table. Um, I, I licensed the third verse of The Times They Were Changing as the epigram from the book for the book. That that was a great moment. I got and I got some Bob stuff. Did you know before you wrote this book that he had come to Madison as an eighteen-year-old and what a role that Madison had played? Or um, I, I knew he had been here. I, I didn't have the details. But what a, what a joy to discover oh, that. Oh yeah, and 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 as I say, to to interact with all the people who dealt with him and to say, okay, I just got to do the, do the best I can. Um, we we approach the uh, his his copyright holders. We want the third verse for times that are changing. They said, uh, "Okay, I'll cost you five hundred dollars." We we said, "Well, we're nonprofits. Okay, two fifty. So, uh, for me, two hundred fifty dollars to to have the third verse of times are changing. Happy to pay it." To our patient producer, we really are <laughs> wrapping up. But let's try to get through the rest of the pictures in, in as expedient way as we can. This controversy just has to be mentioned briefly. So, Peter Pan, a nude version a of nude Peter Pan. A nude version of Peter Pan, because Stuart Gordon, who some people may know, is a great horror director in in the and. Uh, current uh, era, was also the founder of the Broom Street Theater, but before that he had a thing called Screw Theater. And he had been beaten and gassed at Chicago in the, in the convention in August of 68. He decides to do a, perform, do a production of Peter Pan, and he updates it. He turns Captain Hook into Mayor Daly, he turns the pirates into cops, and he turns um, Tinkerbell's pixie dust into LSD. But they couldn't get anybody, when it went to court, trying to shut it down, they couldn't get anybody yeah. to be a plane. I mean, they, to well, essentially... Well, yeah, but the, the, the yeah. illegal thing they did was they had nude dancers. They had, okay. they had women dancing nude under strobe lights to in a gotta de vida. I mean, what a 60s <laughs> moment, right? This and is before hair, but this, yeah. No, th th this is... This or is about a, the time. This, this is... Like a month after hair opened, okay, so this okay. is almost almost simultaneous with hair. Oh, um, Calcutta, other okay, other things yeah, were happening, yeah. yeah, about that time. Um, and and Jim Bowl, who's the DA running for election, you know, tries to shut it down, and 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 they they shut down the play circle, so they go to the Commerce Building and the and and the Film Society. Mike Wilmington and the Film Society let them have the Commerce Building. They cancel the Buster Keaton Film Festival to show this. And they try to go to court, and, and, and they can't get anybody to file the, the arrest warrant, and, and it goes on. For Mike Wilmington, who later became a world, I mean, a nationally known film critic. Right, who Chicago wrote, Tribune. But and wrote also for the, the Isthmus. Uh, press Connection. Press Connection. Press Connection. Excuse Connection. me, that's where yeah. he started. Okay. And then the Isthmus, yeah. But yeah, so the Peter Pan thing. And the Peter Pan thing is, is just a little snapshot, a little snippet of just the weirdness of the late 60s. Next slide. Uh, ah, people! Th what a surprise! Vince Lombardi is an advocate for gun control. Hey, you read David Marinus's book. Um, he was much more uh, liberal than anybody knew. Uh, was think. absolutely okay with gays. Was was strong for civil rights. Was was for gun control. And this surprised me. 
Vince Lombardi was the chairman of the board of directors of the construction company that Dave Carley and Jim Carley owned. David Car uh, Vince Lombardi was here for the dedication of the um, Romness apartment buildings, the public housing. Yeah. Vince Lombardi built public housing. Wow. As I say, contained multitudes. Lots of surprises in yeah. this book. Let's see if we get to just a few more. Uh, so McDonald's on Lake Street, which was here, it was the first in well, the nation. Well, this, this, uh, you know, th this is debatable because this is what they said. That essentially but they offered seating for the first was, time. Usually right. it was just a walk-up setup. Or a drive-up. But I, yeah. went to, I went to their website, and the history of their website doesn't mention this. It mentions uh. some other place. So, but people said, no, no. So... It's 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 debatable. Well, it started in displaying, so it's close by. Yeah, yeah, we can, yeah, we can claim yeah, something. Yeah. Next next slide, please. And uh, oh, and my the, the my predecessor at the Capital Times, Washington correspondent. Yeah, yeah. And the Progressive magazine, yes, very yes, obviously. Yes, so he yeah. played a role again. Somebody who was who was a preeminent figure in the '60s that continued to be a preeminent Absolutely. figure well into the '90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And next slide. And uh, this is the six hundred two club. Is this the six? Yeah. Uh, so, so we, you, you had asked me for advice about covering the gay community in yeah. the '60s. We couldn't really find a whole lot, but this was one of the clubs where people used to hang out. I think, in part. I think, I think, I think, as I understand it, there was a section of the six that that was gay friendly. As uh, the best I could pe piece together, the pirate ship was kind of gay friendly. Um, three bells it eventually became a gay bar, but yeah, yeah, but uh, the, yeah, but um, three bells was 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 gay friendly. But it was very difficult, um, even talking to people. Of the of the time in discerning exactly, and, and I didn't want to say anything wrong, so yeah. so I I preferred to err on the side of let's not put in something unless I can completely confirm and it. Just briefly, I think this will probably be in Dick Wagner's book, but 1969, I believe Crossroads started at St. Francis House. Yeah. Art Lloyd, who was then yeah. an Episcopal pastor, had a lot to do with yeah. that. Again, somebody else that his activism started in yeah. the 60s and continued. In, in retrospect, I think I'd wished, I, I wish I'd outed Warren Knowles. Ah, interesting. Um, I yeah, didn't know. That, um, because I was hoping Dick would in his book, and he didn't. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I, I have, uh, from someone who said he had first person knowledge of the fact that, that Warren was in the closet. The governor of, War, the governor <laughs> so, of Wisconsin was, was closeted. Next show, uh, Ethics yeah. of Outing. We'll talk yeah. about that. And, okay. then, and, then, his <laughs> wife, right. and then his wife leads, uh, leaves him and runs off with, an interior decorator. It's like uh, the wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kennedy in Kennedy, uh, Madison. Yeah. Kennedy at Madison. Um, uh, this October is the field house? This is the field house. 15,000 people. And this is this is his memorial. Yeah. Um, and if, if we have the picture of the King Memorial, um, w th there were two memorials on at Lincoln Terrace. Twice people came to mourn one martyr in the shadow of another. They, they came to mourn uh, President Kennedy in the official state um, service and then they mourned Martin Luther King at an unofficial thing. We and may not be able to get to that, yeah. but the difference with the King Memorial was that, first of all, black students really wanted to be front and center. They yeah. had a, a, a disagreement with was it? Chancellor Sewell, and Chancellor Sewell okay. yielded. Chancellor Sewell, the black students said, black students must run this protest, and things got very tense, and Chancellor William Sewell said, Okay. But reflective of the rioting that was occurring in Washington, it was a very angry time. And so yes. these students were speaking out of, I don't want having to do with you white people, essentially, the, was what, the message what in that we have, moment. But what choice do we have but to riot? Yeah. And, and they, fit, they march up, up to the Capitol, and then they march down. They come to the foot of uh, Science Hall. They sing two, voice, two choruses of We Shall Overcome. And then they go and have these rap sessions in buildings that Chancellor Sewell has kept open. And Sewell says it was the greatest day for education on campus because white students and black students were talking and listening to each he other. He shut down the afternoon classes. Yeah. I mean, there was yeah. an effort to say this is a yeah. significant moment that yeah. we need to honor. Yeah. yeah. And next slide. Otto Feske on the left. That's uh, Raleigh Day, the later Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Here uh, is former head of the Housing Authority. That's Earl Espethes on the far right. The woman is. Um, uh, Mary Lee Griggs, who was Gay Braxton's longtime companion or very valued assistant at Neighborhood House. Neighborhood House, the most important secular in building next slide, in I the think, Bush. I think Neighborhood House, we yeah. show its demolition. Being torn down as part of the Bush. Gay Braxton Apartments, the first public housing the city of Madison built since it built Veterans Housing in 1949. Um, and everyone who lived there in the first iteration had been from the neighborhood. So they, you know, once they finally got to move into public housing, and Mrs. Dervasi 
her apartment was, was the same place where her, her bar and store used to be. So, so those new apartments were a godsend. A neighborhood house, essentially in the traditions of, of Jane Addams and Hull House. Yeah, a, a settlement house, yeah. It was critically important. Yeah. Next slide. Another critical factor, you know, Ivan Nestigan quitting, that was a, a, a turning point. Conrad Elvium, who was became a, chancellor in the late 50s. President, 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 and president and University then, from and then passed away to 62, dies suddenly. He was a very reserved, not quite aloof, had very little interest in undergraduate quality of life, was a research scientist, um, you know, was one who extracted niacin, a world-class scientist, a great scientist, but his death creates the opportunity for Fred Harvey Harrington to become president. And Har Fred Harrington is a man made for his times. He's expansionist. He's going to gobble up that property all along the university and really build, build, build. And he was so made for the times of federal financing and aggressive expansion, whereas I don't think Conrad Elvium was. And he's the one who appoints Robin Fleming and Bill Sewell and Ed Young. And those chancellors had so much of an impact on Madison beyond the campus that Fred Harrington taking over from Conrad Elvium is a critical turning point, not just for the university, but also for the city. But people go to the Elvium Museum every year and they don't know. probably don't know who he is. Right. And next slide. I, I think this is the last one I had, but just to mention. Yeah. You, you, so one other thing, bringing in Nixon, bringing in Republican politics, yeah. um, that one of those hearings, or the hearing that um, Bob Kastenmeier did, one of the speakers was a uh, young Tommy Thompson, yeah. head of the Young Republicans. Yeah. So yeah. there was there was a mixture there of, of both conservative and liberal themes. As you said, we can't put things in a box. David Keene um, founded the the, um, the campus chapter of the Young Americans Freedom in 1965 um, you know, as a direct, you know, almost the same week that the committee and the war in Vietnam was founded. When they founded the Badger Herald in 1969, it was from, you know, those same sorts of people. And the Badger Herald, I think, is economically more vibrant today than the Daily Cardinal is. Well, it's become, like a lot of papers, it's, it's become more moderate. Yeah. It really is uh, a very pluralistic view. It's not yeah. just a conservative paper but, anymore. But, but there was, I mean, people have to remember, like I say, 8,000 people signed that apology to Ted Kennedy yeah. uh, based on the actions of, of 20. And referenda and WSA votes on the war did not show that this campus was monolithically against the war. There were a lot of people who supported the war. So uh, we do need to finish up, but <laughs> just, your, your summary, I guess, you know, this coming full circle, how is this history that took place 50 to 60 years ago still relevant to the here and now? Because the issues that we dealt with then we're still trying to deal with. We're dealing, you know, when, when the Community Development Authority goes to the Bayview Foundation to, you know, renovate and revitalize and, and update the triangle, they need to take into account the previous experience. When we went to do Revival Ridge, when the CDA went, when I was chairman of the CDA and we went to do Revival Ridge, we listened to the neighborhood way more than people did in the early 1960s because we learned that lesson. When we, when, when Black Lives Matter and, and Antifa and other groups heckle and disrupt, they have to look back to the lessons of what we did in the 60s. When we deal with the racism uh, between law enforcement and the community, we have to remember the experiences of the 60s. When we deal with college students, we have to remember, yeah, you're 20 today, but if everything goes well, you'll be 50 in 30 years, and you'll have a legacy of accomplishment and meaningful action, and we have to respect you at 19 because we know what you're going to become. So, so all those lessons of, of the intersectionality of communities and, and the, the way time you know, what we do today is going to matter tomorrow because what people did back then matters today. So we're in, history, similar, history matters. We're in similar stages of life. And I, again, I'm bracing archival science and, his, his, and storytelling because it's always what's connected us with our past. It's, it's also been our inspiration yeah. for what takes us forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, be, because we can... We learn the good. We, we learn what to repeat, and we learn what to avoid. I mean, to, to, to Santayana had it right. You know, yeah. those who don't understand, don't, those who don't study history, um, 
you know, we'll end up repeating it. I think it's those who don't understand history won't understand how ironic it is yeah. when it repeats. But yeah, the, the lessons, I mean, this is why there's history, is because what happened matters. We don't know where we are unless we understand where we've come from, and we won't understand where we're going and, and how to get there unless we see that train of events. So you started out by recognizing some of the people that helped you with this book and everything. Yeah. I want to thank you oh. for uh, the many times, the many kindnesses you've shown me. I remember I was burned out at, at you know the end of my tenure as Fair Housing Council, and you very graciously stepped in and mm. paid honor to what I did. But over the years, you inspire me because you are not only an activist and somebody who makes history, but you know about chronicling it. And uh, I can't think of anybody else that I'd rather have in that chair. So oh, thanks so much thanks for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. This has been Forward Forum. I guess we've now got a two-hour show. <laughs> so thank you. And Mara, Mara a trustee who does amazing work, thank you for being patient with us because we had to get all of this stuff out. There was just no way yeah. we could stop. And uh, this has been Forward Forum. Uh, we hope you'll join us. Go to forwardforum.net for more information. Thanks, as always, to the Sun Prairie Media Center, to the Evview Foundation, to other generous supporters. Listen to us also on Monday mornings from 7 to 9, our new show, Community Conversations, with my co-host, Wanda Smith. We're doing some great stuff there. Uh, thanks, as always, and have a great week.